to check our channel uh, before you start speaking, because it usually takes about 60 seconds to upload to. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yep, we're live on Facebook and we're live on YouTube. So we are good. Okay. To, that means- I'm good to go? Mm -hmm. All right. Dear friends of Ukraine, Welcome to U.S.-Ukraine Security Dialogue 12. My name is Walter Zaritsky. Over the last uh, past few months, I've had the honor of being the event's program coordinator. Today, I will have the privilege to be the event's host moderator. Before we get to our first session with its distinguished speakers and then on to our very rich schedule throughout the morning and early afternoon, let me very ever so quickly do what we traditionally do when opening up our security dialogues. One, briefly touch upon the why factor of our events, i.e. what we're trying to accomplish with proceedings, and equally briefly explain the how factor, i.e. the rules of the discussions, of the discussion. Okay, the why factor, or why we are, what we're trying to accomplish today and tomorrow. The security dialogue series is part of a larger set of forums, seminars, symposia dedicated to taking the pulse of Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic ambitions. More precisely, stronger ties to the US, stronger ties to Canada, eventual integration into EU, and ultimately membership in the premier alliance of alliances, NATO, which this entire process was first professed in 1999, 2000, by both the executive and legislative branches of the Ukrainian government and was eventually backed and endorsed in bipartisan fashion in the United States in 2000 to 2004 by the late Clinton administration and the early W. Bush administration. The first security dialogue was held in 2005 in the wake of the Orange Revolution, where all its marvelous goals and aims meant to underline and underscore the sincerity and irreversibility of, Ukraine, of Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic professions. It set two key and co-equal markers for all future security dialogue efforts. One, divining the depth of possible U.S.-Ukrainian bilateral cooperation in security matters. And two, monitoring the pace of Ukraine's accession into the NATO alliance. It additionally took initial steps with regard to the first marker by taking a closer look at U.S.-Ukraine joint operations in I-4, K-4, Iraq and Afghanistan. Security Dialogue 2 in 2006 took on issues related to the second mark, reflecting on a variety of uh, Ukraine-NATO partnership endeavors in the past and anticipating the offer of a NATO membership action plan for Ukraine, either in Riga in 2007 or in Bucharest in 2008. The excitement was almost palatable at the time. Unfortunately, as everyone now knows, and often laments, the anticipated moves were never made. The map offer stalled first in Riga and more definitively in Bucharest in 2008, when, where Putin famously convinced the Western leaders to say yes, but not now to both Ukraine and Georgia. That, in quotes, disaster, if I could editorialize so boldly, was followed in 2010 by the coming to power of the Yanukovych regime, which in short order, took NATO membership off the table and radically reduced any EU membership goals, aiming instead for a free trade agreement and a visa-free regime with Europe. This initially put a halt to the, uh, the security dialogue series and then produced three events, SD3, 4, and 5, that sought to see if there was anything salvageable, at least with regard to the security dialogue series first marker, that is, with regard to U.S.-Ukrainian bilateral cooperation in defense matters. The eventual forums spoke of possible U.S. aid of issues on economic security or energy security to help Ukraine expedite the desired free trade agreement and visa-free regime. But talk of military cooperation, whether in hard form or even in soft form, struggle against as in form or cyber ops, was assiduously avoided. Again, as we know, events from late 2013 through late 2014 brought 
seismic changes as big as those of the 2007 to 2010 period in the history of the Security Dialogue series. The Euromaidan, or the Revolution of Dignity, emphatically reconnected to full-bodied EU NATO ambitions, in, in fact, eventually turned them into constitutional requirements. It also, and it also brought back the issue of closer US-Ukraine bilateral defense cooperation, indeed with a vengeance, but this time with a rather nasty and ironic twist. Russia, recognizing the globe, the glacial shift Ukraine might make in the aftermath of the Euro Maidan events, took Ukraine to war, even if it, in its less formal or hybrid form, in the process creating not one, but two global conflict zones, namely Crimea and Donbass. No longer might defense cooperation between the US and Ukraine be about joint patrolling and keeping the peace in Bosnia or Kosovo or South Iraq or East Afghanistan. More likely, the issue, more likely the issue would be patrolling the streets, uh, 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 finding ways to keep the uh, uh, Kremlin-induced conflict or war on Ukrainian soil from spreading beyond uh, Crimea and Donbass. Security Dialogue 7, Security, sorry about this, Security Dialogue 6 in 2015 reflected the new reality. There was some general talk about refocusing on old markers, but NATO accession took a backseat to US Ukraine a bilateral defense cooperation and US Ukraine bilateral defense cooperation in several global spots, hotspots, took a backseat to the US-Ukraine cooperation to contain the trouble spots in Ukraine's own backyard. With regard to the last mentioned, four new markers for discussion at the dialogues was set. One, possible US aid to Ukraine to stop external aggression. Two, possible US uh, aid to Ukraine to stop internal subversion, political subversion. Three, possible um, US aid to enhance Ukraine's economic and energy security, four possible US aid to counter disinform and cyber ops against Ukraine. Security dialogues seven to 10, each chose one of the stated markers to study in depth. Together, the events produced a cornucopia of very fresh and productive ideas and plans, some of which have already seen the light of day. We can talk about our the javelins. We can talk about uh, the uh, the uh, mosquito boats that are being supplied to Ukraine. Uh, last year, all those uh, all four markers were revisited, but with the intention of seeing whether the newly elected president of Ukraine and the newly constituted Ukrainian parliament were as committed to the discussion as their post Euromaidan predecessors had been. This year will repeat the process with regard to revisiting the four markers, but will attempt to divine the intentions and plans of the new US presidential administration and the somewhat reconstituted Congress with regard to the US-Ukraine security matrix. President Biden has long been known as a friend of Ukraine, much like his GOP buddy and counterpart, John McCain. The question is whether that will translate into substantial policy changes in terms of US-Ukraine defense assistance issues in particular, matters like the ones we've just been discussing for the last five, six years, and military ties in general, matters like actively restarting the NATO accession process for Ukraine or possibly deepening the enhanced uh, members of partnership links. Hopefully, we will get some answers in the next two days. Okay, with that said, now very shortly to the rules of the discussion. With regard to the speakers, for chairs and moderators, five to seven minutes plus the right of first question. For the keynotes, 20 to 22 minutes, less or more, depends on the keynote, and it's the keynote's discretion. For panelists, 15 to 18 minutes. For discussion, 10, uh, for lead discussions, 10 to 11 minutes. Regarding questions, please place in the chat room. The queries will be read by the moderators. With that, my initial tasks are done. So on 
to our opening remark session and the first focus session. I simply want to note a slight shift in the order of presentation. It will feature Ambassador Yelchenko as the first speaker, then Ambassador Taylor and the Ukrainian Veteran Affairs Minister Pani Yulia Laputina as the dialogue highlights. And then our webmaster, Andriy Dobryansky, will be asked to play recorded remarks by our good friend, Representative Andy Levin, uh, Democrat of Michigan, as the word from the Congressional Ukrainian Caucus. Now, as for a, my, a short introduction of our first speaker, It's very tough for me to do this because our first speaker, uh, His Excellency Volodymyr Yelchenko, Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States, is now a, a good and old friend. I suspect he needs no introduction, but he deserves one. His resume speaks for itself. Note his last three diplomatic tasks. His most recent is his present. Before that, he was Ukraine's representative to the UN. And before that, he was Ukraine's envoy to Russia as its regular and irregular military forces decide to visit in 2014. He's Ukraine's consummate diplomat, and we will miss him greatly. Uh, we know that uh, he is uh, returning back to Ukraine shortly, and we will have a new ambassador. Uh, ambassador Yelchenko, um, uh, I don't want to be moved to tears, but um, we will miss you, sir. And so the word is yours. The first word is, as always has been for a long time, is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zalitsky, for your kind words. And I would like to express my, my special thanks to you personally and to the Center of US-Ukraine Relations for the continued support of Ukraine and for putting a spotlight on my country. Today's event is very timely. Just a few days ago, we crossed the mark of seven years of Russian military aggression and its illegal occupation of parts of Ukraine. There is no question that the actions of the Russian Federation present the single major source of external threats to national security of Ukraine, and in turn, a significant threat to European and global peace and security. The objectives of the Russian Federation with regard to Ukraine remain unchanged, at a minimum, keeping our country under the Russian influence, preventing it from ever moving towards the EU and NATO, and at a maximum, destroying Ukraine's statehood, which after 30 years of our independence, Moscow still fails to accept. As we all understand, this policy is unlikely to change, as long as Putin and his cronies keep the power in the Kremlin. Russia will continue to use every tool and trick to undermine the strength of Ukraine's institutions and disrupt Ukraine's statehood. A part and parcel of Russia's tactics is to weaken the international support of Ukraine, including by dissuading the new US administration from getting directly engaged in negotiations to end the war waged by Russia. At the same time, lobbying and subversive anti-Ukrainian activities of Russian forces in the West are skillfully steering up all possible sources of friction and instability, as well as escalating crises all over the world, distracting the US and the EU from Eastern European region, which the Kremlin claims to be its own sphere of influence. Despite numerous initiatives of Ukraine, aimed at finding a peaceful uh, resolution of the conflict, the Russian armed aggression continues. Despite the ceasefire, 50 Ukrainian soldiers lost their lives in 2020. And just from the beginning of this year, already 23 of our defenders perished from sniper and mortar fire and mines. Over 14,000 lives have been lost since the beginning of the war and this war has no end in sight. The situation in the temporarily occupied territories keeps deteriorating, while Russia keeps tightening its grip 
including by illegally issuing Russian passports to the people. It is also further tightening its grip over Crimea, turning it into a large-scale Russian military outpost in the Black Sea region, as well as suppressing dissent, jailing activists, and persecuting Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians on the peninsula. Russian troops are amassed along Ukraine's borders, with three combined forces groups prepared to engage without any additional mobilization, with numerous military exercises demonstrating readiness to invade immediately upon an order from the Kremlin. The Russian Federation wages not only military, but also a large-scale trade and economic war against Ukraine, intensifying energy blackmail, transit and transport blockade of Ukrainian ports in the Sea of Azov, and showing willingness to project this practice to the Black Sea as well. Russia traditionally uses energy as a weapon and strives to complete the Nord Stream 2 to seal its control over Ukraine's energy supplies and maximize its leverage to influence Europe's strategic political decisions. Last but not least, as well, uh, sorry, U Ukraine, as well as other countries, including the United States, has become a target of Russian information warfare and cyber attacks. And by the scope of damage and destruction, such actions are no less severe than the military aggression. Successfully tackling all these threats means ensuring state sovereignty, restoring territorial integrity of Ukraine, and consequently, guaranteeing peace and security in Europe. This task requires two things. First and foremost, it requires that Ukraine continues implementing ambitious domestic reforms that further reinforce our democratic institutions, strengthen our economy, boost our military and defense capabilities, and address well-known challenges, such as eradicating corruption as we progress towards our constitutionally mandated goals of full-fledged EU and NATO membership. Secondly, it requires a strong resolve, a principled position, and the coordinated approach of our international friends and partners. I would like to express our deep appreciation of the leadership and robust support of Ukraine's main strategic partner, the United States. We all have seen it most recently in the very powerful statements by President Biden and State Secretary Blinken on the seventh anniversary of Russian aggression, condemning Russia's actions and underlining once again that the US will never recognize the attempted annexation of Crimea. We see it in much needed technical and security assistance, the latest example being the Pentagon's announcement on Monday about a new 125 million package for the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative. We see it in the administration's determination to keep in place the sanctions against Nord Stream 2 and count on continued US leadership in preventing this geopolitical Trojan horse project from its completion. Ukraine is looking forward to continue working together with the US on these and many other common threats and challenges that we are facing, and to further strengthen the strategic partnership alliance between our nations. In closing, I would like to thank once again the organizers of this timely and important event, and I very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Andrea, do we have... Uh... Do we have um, Ambassador Taylor and uh, and uh, uh, we we do have Ambassador Taylor. We do have also um, uh, in in Ukraine Ambassador Taylor. We're having a, a just uh, I believe that the term is technichny nuances. So um, there's there are things with Zoom that we can't quite work out. Uh, may I propose then to play uh, uh, Andy Levin's greeting to us, and then we can return once uh, Minister Laputina can join us. Is that all right? Yeah, yes, and I would actually recommend, because I really liked uh, Ambassador Yelchenko's uh, word, I would like to uh, uh, in, in invite him to, to stay on, uh, possibly for one or two questions. 
um, along with the, the, the minister, but thank you. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll okay. The reading right there. Let's, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Ambassador Taylor, you'll, you'll, you'll stay on, yes? Okay, very good, thank you. There we go, and we're gonna share. Hold on. Uh, now I'm the one with the nuances, hold on. Ah, that's why, okay. <laughs> Very there we no go. Problem. There we go. I can share it now. Uh, sharing something doesn't want to be shared. Yeah, do you see him now? Yes, we do. Okay, here we go. We just need sound. I can't wait for the day when we can all be together in the same room. Please rest assured I'm doing everything I can here in Washington to make sure that day comes as soon as possible. Michigan's 9th District includes parts of Oakland and Macomb counties and is home to an incredibly vibrant Ukrainian American community. I've had the pleasure of joining that community for such great events and coffee hours during my first term, even when they had to become virtual events. I love going to these gatherings because I love meeting with my neighbors. And of course, it's also really personal to me because I have the enormous privilege of carrying on my father, Congressman Sandy Levin's legacy. As many of you know, issues facing Ukraine and Ukrainian Americans were deeply important to him. That's why he co-founded the Congressional Ukraine Caucus of which I'm a proud member today. I'm also a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee where my colleagues and I have made Ukraine's future a top priority. I want to assure you that while funding for Ukraine was thrust into the spotlight last year in a way that we didn't really prefer, support for that funding in Congress remains strong and completely bipartisan. And know that I'm committed to making sure it stays that way. I'd like to give you just a few examples that illustrate Congress's bipartisan commitment to Ukraine and my own work on the issue. I partnered with the bipartisan chairs of the Ukraine caucus to urge appropriators to allocate robust funding for Ukraine as they crafted our annual spending bill. This funding helps support Ukraine's democratic progress, counter Russia's aggression, fight corruption, and more. I co-sponsored a resolution disapproving of Russians' inclusion in future Group of Seven summits until it respects the territory and the territorial integrity of its neighbors. And I was glad to see that resolution pass the House, again with bipartisan support. Last year, the House even prohibited the U.S. from using funds to facilitate Russia's participation in a G7 meeting, and we're not going to stop. I also supported a resolution in the House Foreign Affairs Committee to reaffirm U.S. support for Ukraine in its efforts to combat Russian interference and military aggression. I'm so, so happy to see President Biden make that support clear in these early days of his presidency. Just last week, we marked seven years since Russia's 2014 invasion of Crimea. I'm going to quote the president's statement on that anniversary directly because I don't think I could put it any better than he did. The United States continues to stand with Ukraine and its allies and partners today as it has from the beginning of this conflict. On this somber anniversary, we reaffirm a simple truth. Crimea is Ukraine. The United States does not and will not recognize Russia's purported annexation of that peninsula, and we stand with Ukraine against Russia's aggressive acts. I'm 100% behind this message, and I stand with the people of Ukraine as they work to secure a sustainable peace and a thriving democratic future for their country. Ukrainian Americans for Biden had just this type of message as the top priority for the president's first 100 days a clear statement of full support for Ukraine's sovereignty, its independence, and its territorial integrity that holds Russia accountable. I'm so glad that President Biden got this done in just over one month. I want you to know that I'm going to keep pushing for that kind of commitment to Ukraine in the days to come, and always. I want to see our governments engage each other at the highest levels, 
And I hope that when it's safe to travel internationally, the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state will make visits to Ukraine a high priority. Finally, I know that the Nord Stream 2 pipeline remains a tremendous and salient concern for the Ukrainian community. As you know, Congress has sought to block its completion through sanctions legislation. I know the Biden administration opposes this pipeline as well. The State Department has said that they will use all available tools to, come, uh, to counter Russia's malign influence, and they've made it clear that companies risk sanctions if they're involved with Nord Stream 2. Please know that I'll be working in Congress to make sure this issue and others you've raised with me and my colleagues stay top of mind. Again, I want to thank you for inviting me to speak to you today and wish you a successful and an inspiring conference. Know that you have a champion in me in the United States House of Representatives. And I want my constituents listening to know that my offices are open and we are here to help you as we navigate the challenges of this pandemic. Please call my Warren, Michigan or my DC office. And even as we operate remotely, someone will return your call promptly. I wish you and your families good health and I can't wait to be with you again in person soon. Thank you so much and take good care. Nice. All right, that was six minutes and, oh no. And stop share. There we are. All right. Um, I, I don't know if we've uh, pro properly introduced uh, Congressman Levin. Uh, we, uh, an update on Minister Laputina. We are sending a fresh email link to a, a backup. Uh, but in that case, I think uh, while the ambassador is here, uh, Yelchenko, uh, I believe uh, it's uh, it's uh, incumbent on us to make sure people know who, who was just speaking. Blotko? Yeah, I was. Um... I, I was going to say that um, at, at this point in time, uh, 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 we um, we have a situation in which uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Ambassador Taylor's on as uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. And um, so, what I would do is, um, uh, um, what I would say is oh, that uh, she's here. She's here. Mark Levin. She's okay. she's here because yeah. I was about to say that the the piece by Andy Levin was very very important. The Levin family starting with the Carl Levin, Senator Levin, and Sandy Levin, the Congressman Levin, have always been true supporters. And this it seems to continue with, um, with Andrew Levin. And that's very important for us. OK, are we ready then with the next? Yes? We are, correct. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I believe okay. the minister can turn on her camera uh, any time now. Yes, and I, I can. Uh, yes, hello, yes. Truyamo, Truyamo. Yes. Yeah, Truyamo, there's a there's a preamble. Ambassador, Ambassador, Ambassador Taylor. And Ambassador Taylor, we we now. Um, ah, that, oh yeah, we just lost him for uh, the camera. There he is. Is he is he there? I just allowed his camera on now, so whenever he wants to log back on. I am logged on, and I can see and hear you loud and clear. On uh, Minister, uh, welcome. Glad to have you with us. So uh, I'm just just one one minute worth. Uh, I'm just going to simply say now on to our first focus session. I'm glad that Ambassador Yechenko has, has stayed on. Um, the first focus session will be with uh, Ambassador uh, William Taylor and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Pani Yulia Laputina. The theme is what the Ukrainian government anticipates from the new administration in security matters. And um, I will very quickly just simply say that if I introduced one consummate diplomat by introducing Ambassador Yelchenko, I just simply want to uh, say that there is another consummate diplomat with us, and that is uh, Ambassador Bill Taylor, an old friend who's been with us since the very beginning, the very first conference we did in 2000. And uh, I don't think we could have a better friend uh, here in the United States than Bill Taylor. So. With that, Ambassador Taylor, this, this session, and uh, with uh, our Veterans Minister, uh, Ms. Uh, Yulia, uh, is all yours. Sir? Walter, thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Minister, I am, again, so pleased to be on the, on the screen with you. I'm going to have a couple of words and then introduce you, and I, we look forward to your, for your comments. Um, 
And, and let me also just say, uh, reinforce uh, what Walter just said about Ambassador Yelchenko. Ambassador, you've done a great job. It's been uh, our pleasure. Uh, been an honor to have you here. Um, couldn't have had a better representative of Ukraine uh, in Washington. So we will, we will stay in touch. Uh, we will absolutely stay in touch and look forward to uh, being more. Uh, and let me just say, by way of, uh, uh, Walter, you went through some interesting history uh, just before, uh, just before uh, uh, we began here. Um, and and, and there, <clears throat> the history is, is very interesting. And I, I was just thinking back, there have been, we're talking about transitions right now. Um, and of course the Biden administration is, uh, is, is in the full throes of its transition. But there, this is, that's the fourth transition that Mr. Putin has seen um, uh, in, from, from the Kremlin. Um, he saw the transition from President Clinton to President Bush and President Bush famously looked into Mr. Putin's eyes and saw his soul. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was a transition from President Bush to President Obama, and President Obama, as we recall, tried to reset the relations between the U.S. and, and Russia, and we know how that turned out. Um, uh, President Obama had a transition to President Trump, and President Trump had this inexplicable and, and indeed unexplained relationship with President Putin, which, which no one could figure out, and then we still haven't figured that out, <clears throat> but that's gone. <clears throat> now we have President Biden. And President Biden <clears throat> has learned from all of those previous transitions, um, and he has made it very clear. And Ambassador Yelchenko has mentioned it, uh, the Congressman mentioned it, uh, that, that President Biden himself, along with his Secretary of State, but President Biden himself put out statements um, in, uh, in support of Ukraine, um, in support of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, and he did this just this last week. This was, uh, this was a, a, a momentous uh, uh, indication, a strong indication um, to Ukraine, the strong support that, uh, that Ukraine will continue to have from the United States. And not just President Biden, the Secretary of State, put, uh, Secretary Blinken put out two statements, uh, one on Crimea, one on sanctions. Uh, this is again, another strong indication. Um, uh, people have mentioned, uh, Ambassador Yelchenko mentioned that uh, just last week, Another 125 million in security assistance was announced and more to come, more to come um, um, on that. Um, the, the, the sanctions are, 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 are strong um, on, uh, on the Russians and the support for Ukraine is, uh, is equally strong. Um, so we're, we're very um, pleased that the, that the arrangements are, are, are lining up, the stars are aligning here. It's not just the Americans uh, that are in support. The, the Europeans, the, the head of the European Council, the president of the European Council was in, was in Ukraine yesterday and went out to, uh, went out to Donbass um, um, with, with the president, uh, indicating European support. And the Europeans have stuck with the sanctions and the, the sanctions that, the American, that we Americans just put on yesterday were coordinated with the Europeans. So that's just, again, another indication the international community is there to support, uh, to support Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainians are doing their work. Um, the president, uh, President Zelensky, has uh, taken aggressive measures against oligarchs, um, in particular against uh, Russian corrupt, Russian-oriented oligarchs uh, who have control of uh, of, of uh, TV stations that the president has uh, has sanctioned and taken off the air. So uh, all of these all of these steps uh, by Americans, by Ukrainians, by Europeans um, indicate that the that this is going in in the right direction. Um, and um, Walter, as you said, uh, this uh, uh, Minister Laputin, uh, Minister of Veterans Affairs, not Foreign Affairs, uh, 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 is, is joining us here. We'll talk, have an opportunity to talk about all of these kinds of things, um, hopefully answer some questions as well. Uh, the minister, um, been in office uh, since last December, um, uh, is a major general in the security service of Ukraine. Um, so we're honored to have uh, a combat commander, a uh, combat general commander um, uh, addressing us here this morning. Um, she commanded uh, security, uh, an SBU task force in Donbass in 2014. Um, she was a member of the Alpha Group of the SBU um, and, uh, and knows of what she speaks. Um, this is a great opportunity for us to hear from her. Walter, congratulations to you for uh, getting the minister uh, on, on the agenda here, and we very much look forward, uh, Minister, to your remarks. We know you have a, uh, a cabinet meeting, um, so we will, uh, we will respect that, and, uh, and we look forward to your remarks. Minister, the floor is yours. 
Kishka. Thank you so much for such a, a presentation of my, <coughs> of my person. Uh, first of all, I want to <coughs> express my gratitude for uh, all of the tea which now uh, are presented in uh, our forum. <coughs> and thank you, uh, everybody, for importance for Ukrainian uh, situation and Ukrainian security issues, because it's not only an Ukrainian's problem, now it is the problem of all of uh, the world, not, not only even in Europe, because, you know, uh, Ukraine now <coughs> Uh, different, uh, we can say different things, but we know, understand everybody now in Ukraine that we are now on the front line, uh, on the front line on hybrid warfare of uh, military uh, war. And um, now we understand much more uh, the role and the influence of these subversive uh, actions of Russia through uh, the beginning of our independence period, because uh, when we uh, became independent, we didn't understand uh, all of the geopolitical uh, issues and doctrinal issues, how Russia will influence uh, to us and what are the role of Ukraine, what is the role of Ukraine uh, in the, um, the Russian uh, picture of the world. Uh, because uh, when we uh, analyze the Russian doctrines, we see that uh, even in 2000 years, uh, it was created by some politicians, for some scientists in Russia, not, poli not official political persons, uh, that um, uh, these doctrines uh, was with the messages that uh, Russian world, uh, the, the uh, aim of Russian world uh, is to restart uh, and renovate the Russian empire. And empire from Vladivostok to uh, Atlantic uh, beaches uh, of uh, Portugal. And uh, we didn't, uh, even in Russian society, not everybody understands that it is uh, serious, uh, but those things which were intruded into informational space of Russia, into Russia's uh, uh, internal target audiences were after that implemented to the Russian laws and after that, we received the law when the military forces of Russia can be used in the other countries uh, for uh, defense of uh, you know. And after that, we received the military aggression. As a former security service officer, uh, I can um, see that even uh, in Crimea in 1990s, I was the one of the part of the special operation of uh, security force, uh, security service of Ukraine to re renovate uh, the uh, to 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 um, protect the national security and national sovereignty in Crimea. It was the sum of uh, um, actions separatists with the pro-Russian uh, intruded uh, persons to local authorities in Crimea, and uh, after that criminalization of. Uh, Peninsula and try to uh, make an economic expansion uh, in Crimea, uh, and uh, security service was successful. But in 2000, uh, but uh, the bliss ice was not ex uh, for uh, Russia was not uh, successful, and uh, Russia changed the tactics. Russia uh, tried to use soft power instruments, used uh, instruments of um, hybrid warfare, influence on political processes in uh, Crimea Peninsula. And in 2008, I was a counterintelligence officer, and we made an analytical research and the report made a report to our government, to our president, uh, that uh, it will be a real uh, threat for annexation of Crimea. It was 2008. Unfortunately, nothing was done to prevent this situation. Uh, but uh, we know, we, we knew from those times that we should be proactive. Uh, but the level of influence and of intrudence to our uh, political, uh, military, uh, different, uh, even NGOs uh, and the civil society segment of uh, our uh, of uh, um, our people uh, was so uh, strong and uh, systematic uh, that uh, Ukraine can couldn't uh, react. Uh, so effectively, uh, we did everything we can, but uh, in uh, 2011, when Yanukovych came to power, 
we had the Minister of uh, Defense with the Russian passport. We had the, um, our Chief of Security Service, uh, which also had uh, um, some, uh, not some, but very strong links with FSB. Uh, and uh, we even, uh, we didn't have a possibility to uh, tell it somebody because Yanukovych was pro-Russian pro president and we had a pro-Russian uh, um, subversion in our security sector. And many of uh, people uh, try to do everything to protect the country. And uh, uh, we personally, I uh, make uh, my decision to go out from security services all the time and uh, go to uh, civil society to Maidan trying to protect the country. But, uh, uh, and I know that uh, during the period of Maidan, uh, on security service of Ukraine in the, on the territory of uh, our um, central office, uh, was sitting this, uh, our, our guys from this alpha group as a counter-terrorist unit, and they were uh, like zombie from the FSB's uh, messages and FSB influence on this process. And um, when I came out from my, uh, it was, it's, it's my personal experience, when I came out from uh, service and after that it was my down period, it, uh, time changed, power changed and um, our uh, new uh, leadership um, asked me to help. Uh, we, when we uh, detect the situation in security sector, it was uh, everything destroyed but we should react and uh, because of uh, our civil society, because our military uh, patriotic oriented, uh, pro-Ukrainian oriented people, uh, we try to uh, prevent this aggression, uh, the military aggression, it was 2014, it was after annexation of Crimea. Uh, we looked at the situation and the occupied Kramatorsk uh, and Donetsk, Lugansk Oblast. And uh, what I want to say, uh, why it was not a blitz eyes from uh, for, uh, Russia in 2014 also, because Russia had a doctrinal mistake that there is no Ukrainian identity, there, there is no citizen's identity of uh, Ukrainians, but it exists, it is very strong. And uh, when I read the agenda of uh, this meeting, uh, it was the proposal for me to take to to, to um, talk about human resources. What is the role of human resources uh, in the security issues? What I want to say now: uh, human resources is the most uh, resource uh, for uh, resilience in society. Human resources in all of the countries, how I understand it. First of all, in the valuable issue, uh, because the war of, uh, against Ukraine began at the value level. Uh, in fact, Ukraine has become a theater of informational warfare. Uh, the fact of territorial integrity, sovereignty, and independence uh, of Ukraine became a trigger for Russia because uh, it destroyed uh, its uh, geopolitical in uh, interest. And now when we all under the, this big threat, uh, I want to, um, uh, to express my gratitude for um, US side uh, to uh, support Ukraine, uh, because now uh, we shouldn't be a buffer from uh, east to west, we should be a belt of security. And uh, the, uh, how we can create this? Uh, by the um, strengthening the potential of social networking, uh, gathering people who um, understand uh, the real situation. And in this case, veterans are very important because uh, in Ukraine, veterans and defenders of the country are those people who were first who um, take uh, their position and wanted to defend country physically with the military aggression. They are motivated. They had an intention to um, create uh, the uh, new society in Ukraine on democratic values. And we should also understand that these people should be not only veterans, but an active part of the society who will uh, protect territorial uh, defense, for example, who will be active in creation, their own business uh, action in uh, some um, 
patriotic, not, not even patriotic, but uh, citizens' uh, identity uh, promotion in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, also, um, uh, one very, is very important thing, and uh, veterans, uh, veterans uh, diplomacy uh, in the world, for those veterans who are in different countries. Uh, and we now are working in this field. And uh, uh, also uh, one of the small uh, issue is uh, we want, we have an intention to, to take part in warrior games in the uh, United States. Uh, it will be, be uh, some interesting and very emotional uh, step to uh, gather our efforts in um, not only in sports, but in a social movement to keep uh, uh, peace and uh, so on. So uh, another one, one uh, thing is, uh, which is very important, it is the uh, um, informational hybrid warfare uh, um, creation of uh, effective instrument, instruments. My personal, um, my personal uh, proposal uh, is uh, to create something like, not organization, it, it's networking, security umbrella, which will uh, unite all of the um, uh, uh, all, all of those people who are active in networking uh, of uh, national resilience and international resilience. It's in general what I wanted to say. If you have question, I am ready. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, thank you very much um, for, for those remarks. Uh, it's uh, uh, the idea of resilience is a very interesting one. I'm glad you raised that. Um, um, uh, Ukraine has demonstrated resilience, um, and Ukraine has a lot to offer the rest of the of Europe and, and the United States. I mean, the resilience to uh, it's not as you say; it's not just resilience in the face of military aggression. Uh, it's resilience in the face of uh, information aggression, information warfare, of economic warfare, of energy attacks, of election uh, of, elect of election meddling. Um, all of these things uh, are, are, are examples of how the Russians first attack Ukraine. And you were exactly right. You said it right at the beginning. Ukraine is on the front line of all those battlefields. Um, but it's, but the Russians don't stop there. As we know, they, they, they go uh, further uh, to Europe. They go further to the United States. They hack into our uh, incredible hacking job uh, and, and meddling in our election. So Ukraine being on the front line is why we must support, we Europeans, the, the, the world, the international auto support Ukraine. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm glad to have uh, questions. I'm also glad to ask one, uh, uh, Walter mentioned that- uh, yeah, right, uh, <laughs> right, right a first uh, round of question, but, but Minister, um, uh, this is a question actually uh, about what the United States could do. Um, you've mentioned the, the support that's uh, demonstrated, and several of us are talking about the statements from the president and the secretary of state. Um, some people have suggested, I think, um, and this actually uh, could be a question also for, uh, for Ambassador Yeltsinko. Some people have suggested that the United States ought to be more, uh, in, in addition to the military support and the economic support and diplomatic support, that, that it might be that there's a, a role for the United States in the negotiation of how to get the Russians out of Donbass. Mm. Uh, now, now, this has been discussed and, uh, uh, and there have been indications uh, from, the United, from, from the Biden administration that, uh, that this would be a, a, a possibility. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, Minister, if you or, or Ambassador Yeltsin will have thoughts about uh, the role that the United States might play uh, in support of Ukraine uh, in these negotiations uh, uh, with the Russians to, to get them out. Uh, um, Minister, can I go to you first and then to Ambassador Yelchenko? Thank you so much. R really, it's a very practical uh, question. Uh, I think uh, how, uh, I think that um, the question how to uh, support Ukraine uh, real support, give real support. Uh, it's um, also the question of uh, our regional in international security. So uh, if we are going to the democratic uh, 
internationally uh, international uh, democratic and internationally um, understandable uh, way uh, we can see that uh, we should not be uh, like russia we should be uh, we should take into attention international legislation and all of the possible non military issues in this kind in this field the negotiations, the uh, support of the position Ukraine and promote of Ukrainian position uh, uh, to the other countries, uh, because in even in some countries, um, because of some context, I, I don't uh, want to say something bad, but they didn't even don't even understand that it is a war in our country. Uh, <laughs> but when we are saying that it is a war, they, they say, oh, this may be, but when another one independent state say that really it is the war and it is the problem of international security, it's very important. So in this field, all of the negotiation process, uh, if it will be supported by uh, all of the community of uh, democratic uh, countries and especially from USA, it's very important as a, as a thing. But um, you know, I'm optimist uh, by my uh, position, uh, my, by my life position. But I also also a realist um, how to we can um, influence uh, to Russia. Uh, now, one of the real things is uh, economic sanctions uh, because uh, really, if uh, every Russian. Uh, not only citizens, but if uh, Russians who are uh, decision makers in Russia will understand that its influence to them personally, it will be because it's uh, those money, those oligarch schemes, those uh, guess uh, questions uh, and so on, you know, because uh, all of the personalities in, in Russia, which are responsible for uh, making the decisions, uh, they are also, uh, you know, economical, uh, economics of Russia are also corrupted as post-Soviet. And all of the, uh, these processes are, uh, had links with uh, corruption. So economic sanctions is very important. Thank you. May I? Ambassador. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I fully agree with the minister that uh, one of the things which the U.S. can do more is, uh, as we say, to beef up the sanctions. I, I mean the real sanctions, uh, which which will make you know the real people uh, in power in Russia to suffer. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, well, something which, uh, well, some experts would say this is fantastic, but I don't think so. Uh, the disconnecting uh, Russia from this SWIFT, uh, you know, banking transfer system. Another thing which I've heard some time ago from uh, the former Minister of Finance, Mr. Mnuchin, uh, about uh, the ban for uh, you know, uh, Russian uh, uh, air companies to fly to the United States, like Aeroflot. This is the huge revenue for, you know, corrupted money. And uh, thirdly, uh, well, of course, there may be things done with regard to, uh, to, to visas regime. But Russia, but I know that uh, the US government is doing a lot. Uh, now it, uh, it's almost impossible to obtain American visa in Moscow because of the limitations with the staff and, and the general consulates in, of, of Russia in St. Petersburg and Vladivostok, for example, they uh, stopped issuing visas. Uh, and of course, the freezing of, of, of accounts of uh, more uh, Russian uh, oligarchs and politicians, at least in the United States, because there is a lot of money and the figures are well known to the US administration. Uh, another thing uh, which US can do uh, is, of course, to be more actively involved in the, ne the negotiation process uh, uh, in all formats, Normandy, Minsk, and probably some, some others. Uh, uh, probably by appointing another person in place of uh, Ambassador Walker or uh, charging this task to, to, to one of the uh, you know, top uh, officers in the State Department. 
uh, or International Security Council. Uh, and of course, uh, it will be very much appreciated uh, and uh, it will add value to the uh, Crimean Platform Summit, which is planned uh, to be held in Ukraine at the end of August, if the United States could not just participate in that summit at the highest possible level, but also to become the, the co-sponsor, co-organizer of, of this event. It will attract a lot of uh, additional attention uh, uh, in Europe and in in other regions of the world. I think we need to expand uh, the uh, awareness of the situation in Ukraine and the Russian aggression to uh, other parts of the world, not only to the EU or you know, Eastern and Western Europe uh, uh, or Americas. I mean, Latin America, Africa, Asia, there are many, many countries who just lack enough real information about that or uh, stay under heavy, you know, influence of Russian narratives. So there are many things which US can do, but uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that it will come. As you rightly said, Ambassador Taylor, uh, uh, the Biden administration and personally President Biden uh, does not need, uh, you know, to learn more about Ukraine. He and his his people know, uh, well, possibly not enough, but a lot more than than any other previous US president. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you. Um, uh, and you, I'm glad you mentioned the Crimean platform. Uh, this is a very important initiative that, uh, that your government has, uh, has, has undertaken. Um, and we look forward to hearing more about it. And uh, we look forward to the, to, as you say, participation by, by very senior people in Europe and in the United States um, for that, uh, that, that summit uh, coming up in, in August. So this is important. We'd love to hear more about that. Um, Walter, if I've got time for one more question um, for both the minister and, and the ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned, uh, Ambassador, you just mentioned how uh, President Biden knows a lot about Ukraine, and that is certainly true. Uh, one thing that strikes me is, and, I, and Minister, you mentioned this earlier, the Russians don't really understand Ukraine. I mean, the, Mr. Putin doesn't understand Ukraine. Mr. Putin um, mis, misunderstood, misjudged um, Ukraine. Ukraine, he probably thought that, that uh, uh, when he annexed, uh, illegally annexed Crimea and then, then moved into Donbass, he probably thought that, I'm sure he was told, you know, that the Ukrainians would not resist. Well, Minister Yu, as a, as a general uh, in the SBU, um, and all of the defenders um, uh, that, that grew up uh, from, uh, from, a, from, a, from a base that was to, to defend Ukraine, to defend Ukraine and, and stop the Russians. Um, and it's not just the military. It was something that I think, Minister, you mentioned in terms of Ukrainian identity. There's a, a Ukrainian sense, a Ukrainian national idea that, that, that the Russians don't understand. Uh, maybe President Biden does. He needs to learn more about that. But I would love to hear your thoughts about the, this Ukrainian identity um, that has been clearer and clearer. It's part of the resilience that you mentioned, but it's also part of of why Ukraine has, has been so successful um, in, uh, in resisting the, the Russian. But in, any thoughts on Ukrainian identity? Minister, starting with you, and then uh, Ambassador Yeltsinko. Uh, thank you about highlighting this question, because it is, for me, it's a key question. Uh, by this uh, understanding and uh, um, having this uh, national identity, we are still here in independent Ukraine, and I think so. I want to give only one example. Uh, on the 13th uh, of um, April 2014, uh, I was landed to occupy uh, Kromatorsk airport with the, our troops. And uh, it was a very big uh, house in command and control because the Yanukovych's power ran away from the country. It was new people. Nobody knows nobody. And uh, it was a very big, uh, big, real chaotic process. Um, uh, and we didn't uh, even uh, um, understand that we are on the occupied territory. Uh, it was very... Um, 
uh, very sensitive process and crisis management process, uh, and we tried to communicate with uh, uh, local people uh, because we didn't know their intentions and uh, so on. Some of them uh, was um, uh, aggressive and uh, they was under influence of uh, Russians and Girkin's group from Slavyansk, for example, and they um, went to our uh, blog post near the airport, this airport and uh, tried to um, stress us, try to influence on us and uh, want to give a storm of uh, airport, we defend it. Uh, and uh, when I spoke, I was the negotiator. When I spoke with these people, I talked, well, why are you there? And they told me, or oh, it's Banderovci, Karateli, it's Junta, it's Pravi Sektor. Uh, so, oh, uh, why? Uh, from what? Uh, from what uh, kind of uh, um, channel of information did you see uh, that it is? Because I'm from Kiev, I saw it was uh, only uh, some people on Maidan, uh, private sector. It's just not a movement. But why you are in Kramatorsk? I know that. And uh, after um, uh, speaking with them, I understood that it was a, a hidden. Uh, operation information of propaganda uh, of Russian to to intrude narratives and uh, uh, some uh, labels uh, to information uh, to, to local uh, people in Donetsk Luhansk Oblast uh, and they targeted only marginalized people but after that Another one, people came to, to our um, blog post and tell us uh, some something also aggressive. Uh, we um, try to ne negotiate. And after this communication, we understood that it's pro-Ukrainian people. They want to help us. We don't know who we are. And I think that it is a, it was a very important, emotional, and uh, uh, very... Um, uh, strong, uh, uh, strong situation when uh, we understood the, you, that there are some Ukrainian army officers uh, and soldiers uh, and some uh, local people from Donetsk Oblast with, this, uh, with the same values. And we uh, organized horizontally to each other because we didn't have food, we didn't have uh, clothes, we didn't have uh, cars or everything, uh, and we, we should uh, survive in these conditions. Uh, and we didn't even, we, we not even survived. We liberated this territory because of the communication between civil society, army, and local people. So it, it was a very big, big uh, uh, example uh, of uh, national uh, integrity, identity. And so I think that uh, this, uh, uh, these examples should be also well known in the world, that we are Ukrainians are such, such as we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Um, Walter, let me just ask, how's, how's the time? Or, 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 or... Uh, it's uh, up to the uh, to the, um, the minister because I know she has to go to a meeting and um, um, but um, I, I I saw one question I'm just uh, not well, I, sure let, yeah, yeah. Let, let, I, I was going to raise that and and uh, Ambassador Yatsenko, um uh, you may have a sense of this too there is a good question here if we have time for I, I, I have ten minutes I have ten, ten minutes. minutes excellent excellent thank you Minister. Um, uh, so there's, a, there's a question that I really want to get on the table from Oleg Romanchuk, um, and he says, good afternoon. I have the question as follows. Is there any possibility for Ukraine to receive major non-NATO ally status from the United States? Now, this is, I think this is a very interesting question, and it turns out um, that I had a conversation um, with uh, uh, members of the Biden administration uh, team uh, that is focused on Ukraine. Uh, just about this exactly this exact question last week, um, and uh, and and several people have mentioned uh, the membership action plan uh, under uh, that that would give a membership uh, path uh, for Ukraine to NATO, um, um, and we know the difficulties uh, of that. And there are there are members of the NATO alliance who are yet to be convinced, uh, they're not yet convinced that, uh, uh, that Ukraine is, is ready for a membership action plan or membership at this point. Um, 
but it will come. Um, it will come. Uh, NATO membership, I am sure, will be there. They, the, the NATO leaders said this in 2008, uh, uh, and 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 I'm sure they meant it, and they and they will they will stick to that. So it, it will come. But in the meantime, there is a way for the United States to demonstrate security assist, uh, demonstrate strong assistance and strong relationship to Ukraine as an ally, as an ally. Um, and that is through the, the questioner, as, as there's a, a status called major non-NATO ally of the United States. And in this case, the United States government has full control over that. It, it needs no approval from um, any other NATO member. Um, this is something entirely within the, the purview uh, of the United States government. Um, and the United States government could, could, could designate Ukraine as a major non-NATO ally. Um, it would be useful for the government of Ukraine to make that clear to, uh, which they already have. Uh, we've heard several people mention this, but uh, minister, if you have thoughts or ambassador uh, Yeltsin, if you have thoughts on that and, if, and the minister has just a couple more minutes left. Minister, why don't we start with you and then, then we'll go to ambassador Yeltsin. Uh, I think that uh, for Ukraine it's strategically important to, uh, to have the status and to increase our cooperation with NATO. I remember 2006, uh, 2007, when I first time I joined to this uh, uh, understanding what is it uh, NATO, uh, because you know, we have a post-Soviet understanding, but uh, not, not, not a um, very practical understanding that I uh, received in 2006, 2007, when we tried uh, as a security service, we tried to co co cooperate with NATO. We understand that there are the different structure of security sectors in, in our countries and in the countries of alliance. And we try to explain for NATO experts, for example, so that it's very important uh, to communicate with us as security service because, for example, anti-terrorist uh, activity is security service, not uh, Minister of uh, Internal Affairs, uh, as it in some countries. Uh, so we, we, um, uh, we signed uh, with the NATO uh, as a security service first seven uh, goals of partnership. It was the uh, interoperability, interoperability between units. It, it was very important. It uh, some um, English teaching programs for our personnel and uh, also some conventional uh, trainings for international law and, and so on. It was very important. So I think that now and after that we become uh, we became more closer to the NATO military um, standards and we received the um, possibility for training for staff for our personnel and so on. And now, uh, since those times, we are much more closely in military sphere to alliance. We have joint drills, we have joint exercises, we have um, uh, um, annual uh, program, and uh, it's, the program is very right. I think that uh, we, uh, if it will be uh, an American uh, help for us to, 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 to be more close to, to, to the NATO alliance, uh, we will uh, express, we, we now will express our gratitude. So it's my opinion. Uh, but it's also a very important thing, uh, the philosophy of alliance, because um, we implemented the course of strategic communication in our, for example, in the Academy of uh, um, uh, Security Service, and we tried to teach people uh, for philosophy of alliance. And now many of the representatives of security sectors uh, are understand the philosophy of alliance because that it's not only a military alliance, it's, a, it's increasing of standards of social life, of economy and so on. And it's very important and thank you, it's, it's, it's my opinion. Thank you, Minister. Ambassador, you had the last word of this session. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was planning to answer also your previous question about please, the please. Ukrainian identity. Uh, well, let me say that I think the biggest problem is that, as I said in my intervention, that Russia fails to accept uh, Ukraine's independence, even now. Probably this is the result of uh, the fact that we live together in the same house for too many years and centuries. This is the huge difference between, for example, the former Yugoslavia and, and other parts of the world and the former Soviet Union or the former Russia, uh, uh, which means that uh, at, even at the genetic level, uh, Russians really believe that, uh, that, that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people. It's a totally different feeling in Ukraine. I remember the early 90s when you will hear 
the same kind of opinions from many Ukrainians. But now, with years, almost 30 years of dependence and totally new generation is living in Ukraine now, almost. In a couple of years, we uh, uh, will have no, no more people who, uh, uh, as we say, joking, remember Lenin. And uh, uh, so Ukraine has changed a lot and Russia did not. While ambassador in Russia, I heard, well, probably nine of 10 Russians, both politicians and ordinary people would say uh, the same to me that, look, we are the same people. Uh, Ukraine was the biggest uh, or the main factor of the breaking up of the former Soviet Union because Ukraine and Russia uh, are the same. They were the backbone of the Soviet Union and stuff like that. Uh, uh, which means that unfortunately, and I can tell you frankly that I don't share the opinion that a uh, person who will replace Putin with time, because the time will come anyway, will have a uh, uh, very different opinion about Ukraine. This makes the problem of the return of Crimea even more complicated. But we have to remain resilient and, and the time will come because the history is on our side. Thank you. Minister, thank you. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, Minister, thank you very much for your time here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Best of luck uh, in the Ministry of uh, Veterans Affairs. And uh, uh, we look forward to staying close in touch. Walter, uh, back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much, uh, oh, sir. Sorry, uh, um, thank you. Uh, uh, Minister, I just... Uh, uh, I, I interrupted you uh, if you wanted to say it, uh, ma'am. Yes, okay. Then I just wanted to say to both the minister and to the ambassador, thank you very, very much. Minister, I, uh, right, right after we go to, uh, uh, to our next session, our first panel session, I just wanted to say uh, how grateful I am to Panya Anya uh, that she had recommended your participation. Um, uh, your your reputation precedes you. Uh, the work you've done, the enormous work you've done, first in the SVU and now with the uh, with uh, with the veterans, uh, is just phenomenal. And we're very proud of you. We just wanted to tell you. And with Ambassador Yelchenko, again, we will. <laughs> there's going to be mourning in Washington uh, with your pass, passing uh, over to Ukraine because uh, we will miss you, sir. We will miss you greatly. Okay. Thank you very much for both of you. Thank you, Ambassador Taylor, as always. Uh, a wonderful and consummate, <laughs> both chair and panelists and, and everything thank else. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, okay. all of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Pani Hanna, uh, for invitation to this meeting. And uh, I think that uh, only joint efforts uh, will make us successful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now on to very quickly on to Herman. I'm very sorry, and you will get your, you will get, uh, you will get your um, extra couple of minutes. I'm, I'm sorry that we did this. We'll just have to keep soldiering on. Um, Herman, you now have um, a an important task, and that is the first of the plenary sessions, and this one has to do with uh, what the um, uh, new administration might be able to do and help with uh, Ukraine's persistent problem with uh, um, internal subversion. We actually flipped it between external aggression and internal subversion because in some ways, many of the things that are going on in Ukraine right now are uh, um, have to do with internal or political subversion. So uh, um, Herman, with that and with you, I, um, I'm, I'm gonna hand this immediately over to you. Uh, you're an old friend, you've been with us throughout this entire period like Ambassador Taylor and like Ambassador Yelchenko, you're an old veteran of all of this. And uh, so I hand it over to you and to the wonderful panel we have uh, assembled, Adrian and Panya and, uh, and uh, our, uh, our, uh, and, uh, and uh, Ambassador Dan Fried. Okay, it's all yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, Herman, just one to the mute. Okay, thank you, Walter. And I wanna begin by uh, expressing my appreciation 
to you, Makola, uh, Tamara, and Andre for putting together yet another great conference. Uh, I don't think any of us that participate go away without learning something that helps us uh, better fight for common goals. The, the question of uh, internal subversion has been with Ukraine a long time. And in recent weeks, I've been uh, heartened by the move against the pro-Russian media as yet another step to combat and to gradually reduce this threat. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Hannah Hopko, who everybody knows from her days as a journalist to the role she played in Maidan, to her chairmanship of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee of the RADA, and uh, including her uh, current role where she continues to fight uh, for uh, the full independence and integrity of Ukraine. Uh, and I look very much forward to hearing her thoughts on what the next steps will be to reduce uh, uh, internal subversion and uh, also what the US may be able to do to aid those efforts. So let's turn it immediately over to Hannah Hopko. Thank you so much. And uh, it's my honor today to participate in US-Ukraine security dialogue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vlodko. Andri and uh, all organizers for inviting me today. And I appreciate this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Americans uh, for uh, your bipartisan support and the enormous assistance which has been provided to Ukraine through the various programs of the US Department of State, including military aid and financial. And of course, um, uh, many thanks to Andy Levin, uh, Congressman, representing uh, Foreign Affairs uh, House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee for his uh, uh, speech and his powerful statements. So I think it's uh, really uh, important uh, to discuss about the future of Ukraine as an insp inspiring democracy. Uh, I'm sure that Biden needs uh, an international success story for democracy and Ukraine is the place to get it. Uh, America's leadership through noble and powerful values is needed around the world. Uh, President Joe Biden uh, spoke of the duty of American citizens to defend truth and uh, defeat lies. We are convinced that uh, this is a duty of uh, every citizen across the globe who values dignity, security, justice, and freedom. And uh, of course, this is a responsibility of everyone who enjoys the benefits of democracy or who promotes it. And um, defending truth uh, can be hard when your enemy is an authoritarian regime uh, ruled by kleptocratic elites. Or um, for example, in Ukraine, defending truth means protecting our country from Russian aggression exercised through its military occupation of Crimea and Donbass and hybrid attacks on Ukrainian democratic transformation. Of course, fake, uh, fakes and disinformation spread by the Kremlin are weapons. Uh, and um, its bullets uh, are hitting human minds. Uh, this is what our President Zelensky told in his address to Ukrainians after shutting down in early February this year three uh, national so-called TV channels spreading Russian propaganda in our country. The next step was imposing sanctions against Medvedchuk, Mr. Kozak, and uh, more than uh, 19 companies. Uh, why I'm mentioning Mr. Medvedchuk? Because Medvedchuk from 2018 is suing me. And by the way, yesterday his uh, people didn't show up in the court uh, session probably after uh, uh, Zelensky sanctions, which is a good uh, sign, but still the next decision of, uh, in court will be in May. But I think it's really important and um, I'm happy that Herman mentioned uh, um, at the beginning of his speeches that uh, what is next and what is next in Ukraine after post Medvedchuk epoch? Is there any linkages? A post Medvedchuk era and post Putin era. Are we in Ukraine and in the West ready for post Medvedchuk, post Putin, post authoritarian regimes? 
because uh, I don't want um, to see unpreparedness uh, what happened after the Soviet Union collapsed almost mm. 30 years ago, which is really important to mention that 2021 sees Ukraine's 30th anniversary of its renewed independence, as well as a change of presidency in the US. And it's also an opportunity to see the renaissance of transatlantic relations. And um, I think uh, history is uh, very important for truth delivering. Um, mentioning the recent statement by uh, President of uh, Germany, Steinmeier, Steinmeier, why Nord Stream 2 has to be completed. Uh, it's very <laughs> uh, strange argument, but I think that uh, our German friends needs to learn the history and especially uh, this year will be the 300th anniversary of the renaming of the Grand Duchy of Moscow, Moscovia as the Russian Empire by the Peter uh, the Great, who is, by the way, a favorite politician, a political leader of Russian President uh, Vladimir Putin. So uh, by stealing our history, renaming Moscovia into Russia, uh, uh, at that time, 300 years ago, they started their policy of grabbing the territories of independent states. And it's also very important to mention that uh, in this connection, uh, also in Nord Stream 2, I do believe and I hope that um, Americans will uh, provide Ukraine with the new javelins, with, which could become uh, American sanctions and nothing will do more to protect Ukraine Ukraine's defense and security against Russian aggression than stopping Nord Stream 2. Mm -hmm. Why I'm focusing on Medvedchuk, on Mr. Kozak, and uh, I will also mention Mr. Firtash, and I hope that finally we will see the extradition of Mr. Firtash from Vienna to the US. Also, uh, the case with Mr. Kolomoisky, uh, that your uh, Minister of Justice and Minister of Finance started uh, uh, the investigation against Kolomoisky. Because I think it's really very important to help Ukraine to uh, fight oligarchy and to see a success of the oligarchization. Because uh, without your strong support, um, my, my observation, it would be very difficult. Because Zelensky fight against Mr. Medvedchuk, it's a fight against Mr. Putin, let's be honest, and uh, also um, Medvedchuk is still very powerful. He has a lot of people inside Ukrainian uh, special services, uh, intelligence offices, so uh, in the parliament uh, political party. So I think this is the hybrid instruments of uh, uh, Russian interference uh, into domestic policy of Ukraine. And uh, um, thanks for the EU sanctions against people like Medvedchuk from 2014. We do appreciate it and we do hope that Europeans will follow the uh, Americans and, and will do the same. And of course, after the poisoning and in jail in the Navalny, now we see the sanctions uh, from the United States uh, against um, Russian, uh, people, uh, Russian representatives. But still, we, we do hope that also, we will see more sanctions and Nord Stream 2 finally will be uh, stopped. And also, uh, let's not forget about uh, more than 100 Ukrainians uh, which are uh, now in prison in temporary occupied Crimea or in Russian Federation. And we are fighting for Ukrainians which need to be released uh, from uh, Putin's side. And uh, uh, also, I think that it's really very important uh, to talk uh, about Ukraine's involvement into the discussion on strengthening the political dimension of the, the alliance NATO, the NATO 2030 concept um, uh, is a clear signal of allies uh, unwavering uh, political and practical support of Ukraine's state. Ukraine expects that the revised NATO strategy concept for the nearest 10 years would reconfirm alliance commitment to the open door policy and help allies to find a way to implement the decision of 2008 Bucharest summit. At the beginning of February, uh, within our ENDS network, we conducted an online high level discussion, Ukraine-NATO vision 2030. 
And I'm uh, really very thankful for Congressman Connolly for his participation and his powerful statements that um, he looks forward to continuing to work with uh, us in support of NATO's open door policy. As a president of, uh, and here in Ukraine, we do believe that having uh, a unique situation, Joe Biden as the 46th president of the US and Mr. Connolly who visited uh, Ukraine uh, and Lviv and Yavorivsky Polygon, um, and now he is a president of NATO PA, Ukraine and Georgia have a historic chance to receive in the near future membership action plan. And I hope that state security service reform will be delivered uh, before the celebration of the 30 uh, years of renewed independence. And also, since today we also have Ambassador Fried, and uh, we remember his historical role on bringing Poland, Hungary to NATO. And we dream uh, to, to see a new coordinator within Biden administration, like a um, coordinator for NATO enlargement for Ukraine and Georgia, the same what Daniel Fried uh, crafted the policy of NATO enlargement for, to Central, uh, Central European nations advancing the goal of Europe free and at peace. So um, I think it's, it's really important to support us. And also um, since um, oligarchic TV channels never invited me to their TV programs or uh, never, no Pinchuk, no Firtash, Kolomoisky, Akhmetov, because of my criticism and also a demand uh, to see the respect of rule of law and rules, uh, equal rules for everybody and to see them as a tax payers. So I think an important potential contribution from uh, Washington would be a firm, a firm position on the issue of deoligarchization without differentiation between good and bad oligarchs in order to uh, avoid undermining the uh, the oligarchic message. It's important that US government representatives not take part in initiatives or events organized or financed by oligarchs. I think it's really very important. And also uh, with our Lithuanian uh, friends, two former uh, prime minister from uh, uh, different political parties like uh, con conservatives and social democrats, Mr. Kirkilas and Mr. Kubilius, we traveled to different capitals uh, promoting so-called Marshall Plan for Ukraine or new European investment plan. I think it's really important uh, after um, our progress on judiciary reform, and I hope uh, we will see more political will, um, not just uh, to implement uh, conditionalities of IMF, but a true will from different political parties, from ruling mono majority and uh, opposition, democratic opposition, that uh, we will um, finally reach agreement on the judiciary reform and it uh, open an opportunity for more investment because it's really important to see middle class growing and small and medium sized enterprises in Ukraine as a response to uh, oligarchization of media, oligarchization in politics, and when we could say that there are some ministers protecting on lobbying or representing the interest of oligarch inside Ukraine. Inside Ukraine. So um, uh, also many thanks for the US State Department for supporting civil society in Ukraine. Those civil society working with veterans, uh, volunteers, helping um, uh, IDPs. I think it's really important, but the key here it's not only to help us to counter uh, Russian hybrid attacks in cybersecurity like virus theater, and this is unique experience that Ukraine could share, but it's also, it's important to have a strategic, a strategy for next decade for Ukraine, considering Ukraine as a leader of democratic transformation in the region. Definitely, uh, Ukraine could uh, become an agenda setter for uh, Moldova for Georgia and three of uh, countries of uh, three countries could also in the nearest future also um, to, to be a um, um, model for Belarus 
for people of Belarus fighting for uh, dignity, for freedom. And also one day we could see a uh, transformation uh, in the um, Russian Federation uh, still, because uh, I think successful Ukraine, of course, could become a nightmare for Mr. Putin, but the success of Ukraine's democratic transformation will largely determine the fate of other countries in the region. And I remember in the parliament of eight co convocation, we established an interparliamentary assembly, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, for better coordination with Brussels and Washington. So I think it's within the Eastern partnership and for the whole post-Soviet pace within next decade, it's really important to talk about uh, regional, uh, the role of Ukraine as regional leader and uh, I hope in uh, the agenda by, of bilateral relation, uh, relations between Ukraine and US, one day we will not see uh, in the program like uh, how to tackle vested interests of oligarchs, how to make uh, Ukraine stronger with the rule of law, institutional capacity of uh, our governmental, uh, governmental institutions. So, uh, and we will be talking about how to spread the successful example of Ukraine and inspiring democracy at the whole post-Soviet space. And this is the mission of Ukraine in the 21st century. And I hope with the new uh, Biden administration, we will uh, start talking about this role. And of course, uh, it's not easy uh, knowing the situation with uh, uh, in, in parliament, uh, oligarchic influence, but I think uh, the phone conversation between Zelensky and uh, President Biden is very important, uh, the same as a visit. And uh, I hope uh, during uh, Biden presidency, we will see him as a president this or next year in Ukraine. And uh, this historic visit will help us to progress uh, in our, uh, towards our Euro uh, Atlantic integration. I might, might stop here expressing gratitude to everybody who is organizing today's discussion and honestly saying, I remember my first meeting with Vice President Biden in 2014, just after Maidan. At that time, I used to be the co-founder of reanimation package of reforms. We were discussing uh, about oligarchs, rule of law, decentralization reform, and now in our agenda, when Biden became a president, still how to uh, uh, stop this very uh, damaging for Ukraine's democracy um, influence from Russia and their representatives here. So I do believe that Europeans will follow and sanctions against Medvedchuk and Russian agents will be imposed and also Nord Stream 2 will be stopped and we will push within Ukraine to achieve more in state security service reform, independency of anti-corruption infrastructure where uh, Americans invested a lot. And of course, uh, the prosperity of our people based on um, middle and medium uh, entrepreneurship, not just uh, big oligarchic influence. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we'll go directly to uh, Ambassador Freed and Adrian Karatnecki before opening up for questions, which have already uh, started to come in. Over the past 40 years, I don't know of any American diplomat that has had more extensive experience in the Slavic states. Uh, Ambassador Freed served in Belgrade and then Leningrad and Warsaw and uh, in major post in Washington dealing with uh, 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 Central Europe. Uh, Anna Hopko referred to his historic role in expanding NATO and observing and facilitating uh, uh, changes in, in many countries. And therefore we look very much forward to uh, uh, hearing from Ambassador Freed and, uh, and uh, his thoughts on what can be done to deal with uh, subversion in Ukraine and how the US can help. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be invited to speak and an honor to follow Hannah Hopko, with whom, as usual, I am in substantial agreement. Um, why does Ukraine matter to the United States? Why do we care? 
for two reasons, principally. One, we fought World Wars I and II and the Cold War to prevent Europe from being dominated by authoritarians who would conquer other nations. That's why we fought it. We fought World War II to liberate all of Europe, not just Europe up to the line that Mr. Stalin and Mr. Hitler drew. That's one lesson. The second reason the United States should support Ukraine is that Ukraine's success at its democratic and free market transformation, its Europeanization. And remember that the demonstrators in the Maidan were flying the European flag, not the NATO flag, not the American flag, the EU flag. Ukraine's success, a country that is largely still Pravoslavny and largely Russian speaking, its success as a democracy, a Europeanizing democracy, would be a blow, perhaps a fatal one to Putinism. It would actually be good for Russia because it would show Russians that they have an alternative to Putinism, that they have an alternative to Putinism. So for those two reasons, protecting Europe from dictator's aggression and advancing democracy in the service of a Europe whole free and at peace, are two big reasons why the United States should help Ukraine. Now, the Biden administration has to deal with the utter mess in US-Ukrainian relations that Trump left. The utter mess is a result of Trump not really caring about either of the objectives which I laid out, in fact, being rather hostile to them. On the whole, Trump preferred Putin. And he looked at Ukraine, as we all know, solely through the prism of his own personal political fortunes and treated Ukraine instrumentally. And as an American, I am not proud of that record. We have to dig our way out of that mess. And President Zelensky can be forgiven if he has some questions about Washington. He doesn't know Biden. Biden doesn't know him. Um, I am also, as Hannah Hopko mentioned, I'm looking forward to that first phone call. So that is what, that's the context in which the Biden administration is coming to power. It is a team that knows Ukraine well. Biden's role is well known. Tony Blinken, Tony Blinken played a critical role when he was Deputy National Security Advisor. And I'll be quite specific about this point. The Obama administration was divided about how strongly the American government should respond to Putin's attack on Ukraine. There were those, and I know this from direct experience, who didn't think it mattered. They didn't think it mattered. There was a debate inside the White House. Tony Blinken supported a strong response in general, and he gave me in particular the mandate and let us say political cover I needed to negotiate sanctions with the Europeans. Mm. Without Tony Blinken, I could not have done it. Mm. That's, he didn't take a lot of credit. I know perfectly well what he did. That is important to remember. Now, Toria Newland coming in as the Under Secretary for Political Affairs has a well-known role. Tony Blinken's role is less known. It is as, if not more important because he gave Toria and me the political cover we needed to lead a strong US response. The one area where the Obama administration failed was weapons to Ukraine. The Trump administration was right to reverse it, though Trump didn't do it to help Ukraine. He did it because his staff presented him with the opportunity to reverse something Obama did, and Trump took that. So he did the right thing, not for the, the right reasons, but it's okay, I'll take it, it was the right policy. What do we do now? The United States needs to help Ukraine on two principal fronts. One is protecting you, helping Ukraine defend itself from external aggression, which means Russia. Well, it means Putin, I should say, not Russia. External aggression, both military aggression and Putin as has the ability and to escalate the military aggression in the Donbass if he chooses. 
and internal subversion. And you can probably guess that I'm going to praise the belated but welcome Ukrainian government sanctioning of Medvedchuk. Why it took them so long to go after one of Putin's agents in Ukraine is a mystery. Someone will have to explain that to me, but they did it. Um, Putin wants to destroy Ukrainian democracy and effect, destroy effective Ukrainian sovereignty through a combination of military pressure, diplomatic isolation, and internal subversion. And this is no secret. Everybody listening to this already knows that. Hannah Hopko, Hopko most of all. The United States can help Ukraine defend itself from external aggression, both military and through subversion. There are things we can do. The Ukrainians are going to are better equipped to know who is who, but we can help somewhat. We can help, we can work with Ukraine to identify Putin's vectors of internal subversion and aggression. Ukrainians and we can work together to identify Putin's agents in Ukraine. And I don't mean just you know, intelligence cooperation, though that's part of it. I also mean following the money. Mm. What are the trails of corrupt Russian money? Putin money. And the money of Putin's circle influencing Ukraine. That is something the Biden administration in general says it wants to go after. It said publicly it wants to dry up channels of dirty money, including dirty Kremlin related money. And we need, as, a, as a U, the US government needs to strengthen its capability to do so. Much as we strengthened um, the ability of the US government to run a, a capable and broad sanctions program in general, we need to do the same with other institutions in the US government. And we can do that in cooperation with Ukraine. Countering Russian disinformation, well, Ukraine has some local expertise groups like Stop Fake, working with groups like the Baltic Elves or Bellingcat or EU or, or, or East Stratcom, EU versus disinformation, or US groups like the Digital Forensics Research Lab of my own uh, Atlantic Council where I work. Mm -hmm. Identifying in real time Russian disinformation campaigns and exposing it can be useful. And it has to be done on a cooperative basis. You know, Americans and Europeans can identify these groups. Ukrainians have to disseminate that information within Ukraine. That's a lot of work, but, but the major work has to be done by the Ukrainians themselves. The, as long as Ukraine is politically divided and corrupt and, and where corruption plays too large a role, Ukraine will never achieve its European future. Putin's policy toward Ukraine is almost identical, it seems to well, identical. It has parallels with Catherine the Great's policy toward the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Keep it weak, keep it divided, use your agents, oligarchs now, the magnateria then, to keep it backward and under your thumb. And you probably can guess, those of you who know the history where I'm headed with this analogy. In this analogy, the Maidan becomes the Ukrainian equivalent of Poland's third of May constitution, a liberal constitution that promised to strengthen the Commonwealth and modernize it. <laughs> and the Russians promptly invaded Poland invaded the Commonwealth and destroyed it rather than face its modernization. You see why I was taken with this parallel. Ukraine's survival depends on Ukraine internally reforming itself. Hanna Hopko asked about NATO membership. And I remember that process very well. I was in Poland in the first years after 1989. The Poles started thinking about NATO membership very early. But I told them at the time, that was that is not what you want to talk to Washington about. Poland 
in 91 was a mess. Its economy was still sinking, its politics was divided and getting worse. This, that was not the time to force the NATO membership question. They'd lose. They had political capital from 1989 and, and some credibility, but most of Washington thought that Poland would fail in 91 and 92. I know, I was in Warsaw at the time. I know what people in, in Washington were thinking, but Poland did not fail. It turned itself around 93, 94, 95, and by then, their economy was growing at Chinese rates of growth. Their politics was stabilizing. They were looking like everybody's, the, the best case was coming true. That's when they started raising NATO. Their political capital was now refreshed and powerful and they invested that political capital in their drive for NATO membership and it worked. Now, let's be clear. Ukraine faces a worse set of circumstances than Poland did then. They had to deal with Yeltsin. Ukraine has to deal with Putin. Europe and the United States in the early 90s were confident. The West is less confident now. So I can't offer Ukraine the same deal I could, I could offer Poland back in when I started working in the Clinton administration in 93. But, but the historical cycles can turn. And if Ukraine does what it needs to do at home, and becomes a success story, its political capital will grow. Its political capital will grow. And that is the time to address these larger issues. The, I recognize perfectly well that Ukrainians are frustrated because Biden has not had his first phone call with Zelensky. I totally get that. But Biden is not going to forget Ukraine. Blinken is not going to forget Ukraine. The issue is how the, Ukraine, how the Americans can help Ukraine in the near term to defend itself against Russian external and internal aggression and how much Ukraine can do to Europeanize itself, which is what Zelensky was elected to do. He was elected to break the iron ring of oligarchic control. And he needs to do that. And the signals have been mixed. A step forward, a step back. He dismissed, he hired reformers and put them in his government. He fired the same reformers. He's, it's mixed and you all, and we all know that. He needs to drive forward in the right direction. And then the United States needs to work with him. So there is much to do, but the, oh, and uh, final point, one of the challenges the Biden administration will have is how much effort to put into engaging in a diplomatic solution to achieve a settlement in the Donbass. And in that context, how many sticks to develop in terms of sanctions and other measures. So in addition to everything else, the Biden administration is going to have to, um, think about the Dunbos. Um, look, I, I, there's more to say, but I don't wanna go on too long. And the, uh, the Biden administration does, you know, after, after the, the misery of the Trump administration, the Biden administration is going to do the right thing. Their first policy announcement with respect to Ukraine is to increase military assistance. So we now know that they're not going back to the mistaken Obama policy of staying away from military assistance. That's a good thing, a good sign, and hope for better days ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, now we're gonna go to Adrian Karatnicki. Um, he's been active in the Ukrainian diaspora practically his entire life. He's now at the Atlantic Council with Ambassador Freed. He previously had a Freedom House is very active in economic life in Ukraine. And uh, Adrian, we look forward to your comments. A pleasure. Um, we are speaking about how to deal with uh, disinformation and how the United States can help. Uh, at the same time, I think the most important way of helping Ukraine is for Ukraine to understand what it needs from the United States, 
what kind of policies it is pursuing domestically uh, to counter the threats of misinformation, disinformation, and so on. But I think it's wrong to even approach the problem as disinformation. The real problem is an entire media environment which holds captive substantial portions of the Ukrainian population, uh, enabled by fifth columns and by fifth column political parties uh, that uh, continue to perpetuate uh, you know, false uh, narratives about the history of the country, about its uh, purpose, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, the actions taken uh, last month in the banning of the financing of three uh, television news channels, uh, which had uh, a total combined staff of about 1,200, um, of 1,200, and operated and occupied a very important space in the flow of information to primarily the Russian-speaking uh, electorate or the electorate of south southern and uh, and central Ukraine it represents, I think, a critical moment and a critical uh, breakthrough that, if it is sustained and perpetuated. Uh, uh, will allow the United States to find an adequate partner and to shape projects and programs uh, that work because without Ukrainian leadership understanding threats and its own national purpose, it is very hard to counter this uh, long-term cultural, political, uh, and financial uh, uh, influence. Um, in May of 2017, President Poroshenko made an important step in limiting some of the propaganda influence of Russia uh, when he banned Russian social networks, television uh, channels, et cetera, et cetera, from access to Ukrainian airspace and, and the banning of some websites. Now, naturally, some people uh, could use VPNs to go around it, but in the main, uh, the vast majority of that audience uh, disappeared. At the same time, Russia began very concretely to accelerate its mechanisms for financing uh, internal, uh, for replacing that lost influence by empowering and financing large internal mechanisms of similar uh, disinformation, but again, an inadequate term of, of an alternative view of, of history, of values, of politics, of Ukrainian identity. This was done through these three TV channels, but May of 2017 is the ban. At the beginning of that year, Russia issues a tender for an oil and gas field, a tender that has very specific conditions, which require that that oil field in the Khantimansi region have a refinery that was then in the hands of the Medvedchuk family, of the Medvedchuk network, uh, it required as a condition of winning that tender that there be a refinery in Rostov Oblast uh, where already uh, Mr. Medvedchuk had uh, developed uh, some of his uh, economic and wealth creation uh, presence. Months later, not surprisingly, Mr. Medvedchuk's wife, uh, Oksana Marchenko, won that tender for an oil field whose proven reserves are, uh, are worth about $600 million in oil and about, I'm calculating, 1 1.4, 1.3, 1.4 billion dollars in, in gas. Uh, now, we don't know the pace at which these uh, <laughs> holdings are being extracted. Uh, but we do know that roughly the Russian take, the Russian government's take of extraction of uh, energy is about 43% uh, for, uh, for oil. That's tariffs, the overheads, and so on. So you're talking about more than 50% of that is pure revenue that can be used for whatever, uh, whatever purposes. This is a massive, massive creation of a resource uh, that helps sustain. This is not the only one. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, propane gas uh, business, a pipeline of 850 uh, uh, miles or so, all in the Medvedchuk uh, universe, in the universe of Mr. Medvedchuk, his ally, Mr. Kazakh, and Mr. Medvedchuk's uh, wife. When you look at Mr. Medvedchuk's Ukraine holdings, he holds a law firm and a consulting company. 
but pretty much everything else is derived from a network of associations externally operating through offshore uh, uh, companies and through these large uh, privileged businesses that the godfather of his uh, daughter, uh, President Putin, and uh, has, has uh, allowed him. In the pipeline, his business partner is uh, Mr. Uh, is is the is the is one of the billionaires in in uh, Belarus and one of Mr. Lukashenko's allies. So this is so the pipeline that Mr. Medvedchuk holds. He is, you know, fifty percent uh, co-owner, or his his network is fifty percent co-owner uh, with uh, the Lukashenko uh, interests. So this, I think, r explains uh, some of the scale of what Ukraine is confronting. The, this is only one of a set of channels that Russia has, which need to be uh, examined in detail. And so I would say that in the battle against uh, misinformation, we first have to understand the amounts of resources that Russia is pouring in. Secondly, these have to be detailed and uh, you know, security cooperation and intelligence sharing uh, should be an important part of the US relationship in, in, in combating this, but also understanding the scale of this effort to maintain influence over the hearts and minds of Ukrainians. Today, there was a poll that showed that only 50% of Ukrainians have a negative view of the Russian Federation. This is a serious problem. This is with part of the Donbass lost, with part of the uh, with uh, with Crimea under Russian uh, uh, control, and those electorates not being polled in that sampling, it still shows a huge impact and influence from these years and years of propaganda, both first through Russian channels and then through their proxies. So, to understand what we're coping with. These channels that were that were banned are not really banned. They're still operating on the internet. They're not on airspace. Uh, they're not operating over. Uh, you can you can watch them on, on Facebook should you uh, should you wish. But in general, they've been banned from um, cable and from uh, the open uh, broadcast <coughs> airwaves. Uh, but if you examine their propaganda, it is really striking at how primitive it is and how much it echoes the Russian uh, tropes. It is really a surrogate internal broadcaster for Russian propaganda. And the, the myth of a linguistic genocide in Ukraine, the myth of an economic genocide against the people of Ukraine, the idea that Ukrainian soldiers are being harvested for organ uh, transplants, <coughs> that uh, Ukraine is guilty of aggression against Russia, that the Donbass is simply defending itself against fascists and nationalists. These are not the tropes of Russian television. These are the tropes of this so-called Ukrainian fifth column uh, 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 television. That the Donbass, that Russia's military acted in the Donbass to protect the population from an attack by the Ukrainian uh, uh, military and from the Ukrainian <coughs> far right forces. This is what was propagated on these three channels throughout the Poroshenko administration and for the first 18 months of the, uh, of the, of the Zelensky administration. And clearly now that there has been this step taken, which I would say, apart from the banning of Russian television is the other most important step taken. There has been a little bit of a, of a positive effect Recent monitoring by Detector Media of Inter, a, I would say, Russia-leaning, Russia-friendly channel, has indicated that the content, that the pro-Russia content on that channel has uh, diminished in its, in its intensity. So I think that this greater scrutiny to what uh, some of the channels that have been uh, criticizing the Ukrainian um, uh, government uh, and undermining support for the war effort and the resistance uh, to Russian aggression, the actions that were taken in a very limited sense, because we have to remember, this was not an attack on these TV stations. It was an attack on the financing mechanisms which trace their roots in Russia and in trade with the uh, designated terrorist LNR and DNR uh, entities. All those have been uh, documented by the Ukrainian 
uh, security services by Ukrainian intelligence services, and they were the basis for this for this ban. So coming back to <laughs> what the United States can do, first of all, I think it's extremely important that the leadership of the United States be fully aware of the degree to which this disinformation, this culture has been perpetuated inside Ukraine. This is a much longer term problem for Ukraine, a problem that would be exacerbated were there to be a peace settlement and the Donbass were to return. And therefore there has to be a dialogue about communication strategies, not just to shut off these channels of communication, but to reach out to these people who's, you know, who've been brainwashed by this torrent of, of, of misinformation, this culture of uh, misinformation for, well, in some cases for 30, for 30 years since you uninterrupted, since you created independence, for in some cases through these, uh, and through Russian television and through, in some cases through, uh, through these indigenous uh, fifth column um, uh, channels. So I think the, the Ukrainians have announced an effort to create a counter disinformation agency. I think cooperation and possibly some resources for that would be um, would be important. But really knowing what the challenge is, having a clear indication of the scale and of the resources that Putin is, is putting into this just through this one network, through this one family, and helping to document other of these uh, kinds of channels of financing of fifth columns and of this climate of opinion that uh, Russia seeks to create inside Ukraine, to split Ukraine, to undermine its, uh, its independence and to, and to uh, undermine support uh, for its war effort. All those kinds of uh, um, issues should be uh, on the agenda for the new administration. And I think it will be easier to have that kind of a discussion because Ukraine and Ukraine's president has at least on this instance found his own voice and properly understood uh, the challenge and, 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 and kudos to a participant, a former participant in these, uh, in, in uh, uh, Walter Zaritsky's conferences, Mr. Danilov, the head of the National Security and Defense Council, who is really uh, forthrightly led this process, moved uh, you know, over the course of a year systematically to the point where Ukraine has finally uh, begun the first steps in addressing this uh, incredible threat to its internal stability. I'll end it there. Thanks, Adrian. Um, there are some questions that are backing up and we'll get to them, but first I have a comment and a, a question of my own. Uh, Ambassador uh, Yelchenko, uh, remarked on the deepness of Russian imperialism in the culture, and that the person that follows uh, Putin is also likely to be imper imperialist. I would guess that Ambassador Freed would accept the general proposition, but I understand that he is a little more optimistic that things could be different under a post-Putin leadership. Maybe the differences in the changes between uh, uh, Stalin and Khrushchev, or the difference between uh, uh, those that preceded him and, and Gorbachev. Uh, Hannah Hopko had uh, a point that I think uh, is relevant to that. She said, there will be a post-Putin and we better have contingency plans in place to be ready for whatever comes because uh, if I can interpolate, uh, the time to act may be narrow. And if you're not ready to act quickly, opportunity will be lost. And uh, I have to modestly say, I had a little book post Putin that dealt with this problem that's now in the Ukrainian language. Now to uh, my question, which feeds off uh, uh, Adrian's uh, comment and will be for Hannah Hopko and Ambassador Freed. Uh, Adrian was saying, the, the problem of uh, Russian subversion inside Ukraine is much bigger than is generally believed in Washington. And therefore, if I can interpret it a little bit, if Washington doesn't know uh, the depth of the problem, there may not be the will to support the very, very difficult decisions that any Ukrainian government will have to make. So my question to, uh, Hannah Hopko first and Ambassador Freed second is uh, 
to what degree do you think this analysis is right? When you talk to Americans, do they understand how bad the problem is of uh, Russian uh, subversion? And uh, would uh, greater knowledge uh, stiffen the backbone of those that want to act? First to Hannah Hopko. Thank you, Mr. Herman. I read your book, Post Putin, and really appreciate your thoughts. Uh, so many thanks for very um, substantial uh, work. And so, uh, of course, uh, let me a little bit uh, not argue, but uh, with uh, Ambassador Fried. Of course, we know about our do uh, homework and the domestic reforms need to be delivered. Uh, which is really important. But let me also uh, uh, um, remind you about 2008 declaration. NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agreed today that these countries will become member of NATO. Both nations have made valuable contributions to alliance operations. So uh, it was 2008. So uh, Russian aggression against Georgia, Russian military aggression and occupation uh, against Ukraine. So I could say that now Ukraine has unique um, experience. We could share with West Point, with our NATO uh, friends, uh, how to um, tackle uh, hybrid uh, um, aggression. And also, according to NATO, Ukraine is the only non-NATO partner nation to have contributed actively to all NATO-led operations and missions for the past two decades. So I remember a very famous picture, Joe Biden and President Yushchenko in Kiev 2006, when there were, there were a discussion about membership action plan. So also, let me be very honest. Uh, I'm optimist, and I believe that one day you will realize that uh, with Ukraine, NATO become much stronger with our unique experience. And also, I remember my visit to Washington in 2014 during NDI Democracy Award uh, with participation of Vice President Biden. And at that time, we were advocating for Ukraine Freedom Support Act. And I remember all our efforts when I was mentioning my, at that time, three and a half years old daughter. It was just after Maidan and others. And we convinced the congressman to uh, adopt Ukraine Freedom Support Act. So having um, Gary Connolly, having bipartisan support, I hope one day we will convince uh, American friends and also uh, different nations within the alliance to create this political will for Ukraine and Georgia to receive membership action plan first, and then to open uh, a perspective for uh, membership uh, in the alliance. Why it's really important? Because it's a mobilization tool for our political elites, also for civil society organization to do more, like with visa free regime with the European Union in 2016. I remember when we implemented 144 uh, different um, criteria, different reforms, because we were motivated to have this fundamental right of uh, freedom of movement within the European Union and other countries, which is really important. So uh, from the purpose of domestic reforms, we need like extra push, uh, extra carrot uh, uh, to reach, to, to achieve more. And of course, we understand that for Russians, if they, uh, for, uh, not for Russians, for Putin, uh, the more Ukraine receive from the West and the closer we will be to the European family, of course, uh, it will make angry Putin. But why we should be uh, thinking about uh, Putin's anger, uh, um, that angerness when we have to think how to protect the democracy and Ukraine is a part of a uh, democratic society. And also uh, I wanted to add to the, um, this information, which is really important to have Voice of America uh, to create an Eastern Europe Bureau in Kyiv and to cover to the whole region 
important information and also to support radio li uh, uh, liberty, uh, public uh, Ukraine, public broadcasting, suspilme, through USAID programs. This is like extra uh, um, uh, efforts um, to respond on the Russian disinformation and hybrid uh, warfare in the media, creating a content and also supporting unbiased uh, media like uh, uh, public broadcasting and uh, Voice of America or Radio Liberty. Okay. Ambassador Freed. Anna Hopko made powerful arguments that we need to take seriously. I was at the NATO summit in Bucharest. So I know that fight over the membership action plan, you know, I feel it on my skin to this day. Um, earlier, as, as I was coming into this session, I was listening to Bill Taylor argue um, the merits of Ukraine simultaneously pushing for a membership action plan and for non-member, you know, a, a, the status as a major non-NATO ally. One does not preclude the other. I'm interested in making progress and building a relationship, a security relationship between Ukraine and NATO, between Ukraine and the United States. I want to do as much as we can. I think Hannah Hopko's strategic arguments are right. That is the prospect of integration into the European world and the Euro-Atlantic world it can be a powerful incentive. She's right. The question is, what can we do? Because to push and fail would be a disaster. When we push, we have to win. The next time we push for a membership action plan, we have to succeed. So I am in the position of a practitioner and I know what failure looks like because we thought we might be able to push it through in April in Bucharest in 2008 and we did not. I wanna pick the moment and when we move, we need to win, but we can't be paralyzed while we're waiting for the moment, which is why Bill Taylor, who by the way was an early champion of pushing for a membership action plan. He, he pushed Condi Rice on that before Rice was ready to hear it, but he won the argument eventually. So listen to Bill Taylor. You have a, a lot of strong friends. He's one of them. Um, couple other points to make. VOA and Radio Liberty. Hannah Hopko is absolutely right. The Trump administration made a mess of this by appointing some, they, they fired the leadership of RFE, RL plus Radio Free Asia because they didn't like these people advancing, doing in the 21st century what Radio Liberty and Radio Free Europe did during the Cold War, but updated for new conditions. The Biden administration has hired back Jamie Fly, who is a Republican, a Republican and a, and a serious, you know, he's been, he's, I think he was a, Mitt Romney advisor in 2008, they, uh, 2012, he, they hired, rehired Jamie Fly to head, head Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, and Jamie Fly is excellent. It's a great decision by the Biden people. The part of our, ex, the, our combined efforts, U, US, Ukrainian, European, to expose Russian disinformation Radio Liberty can play a major role. Okay, they can do a lot. So this is actually good news. Um, do Americans understand the threat of disinformation? This was a question. A lot more than they used to, but it has also become a politicized issue because Trump denied it. A lot of the Republican Party, the parts of the Republican Party that are under his thumb must therefore also deny it because he controls them. Now, all of the Republicans who have been friends of Ukraine are still friends of Ukraine, right? Um, you know, Steve Began, who was deputy secretary, conducted his, 
he supported Belarus democracy as if the Trump administration, as if President Trump believed in it, which he did not. But Steve Began did the honorable thing. There are a lot of people like that, but the the issue has become politicized. There is a much greater understanding of the threat of um, Russian disinformation generally, if the Republicans are now not as united against it as they should be and used to be, the Democrats are more united. There are large sort of constituent elements of the Democratic Party political base, including the African American community, which is now aware of Russian disinformation, Kremlin disinformation aligned with extreme right-wing white nationalists in the United States. So, you know, I never before spoke about Kremlin disinformation operations to civil rights groups. But when I did last year, they were focused. They totally got it. They didn't need me to convince them. They were already in the, spa in the place of what do we do to fight it? So, there are new constituencies and new friends in this struggle. And I hope the Republican Party can find its way back to its better traditions and, and disenthrall itself from Trump. Finally, post-Putin Russian future and what the Ukrainian ambassador mentioned. Um, you can divide Russia experts in the world into two into lots of categories, but I like dividing them into the following two categories. One, those people who think Russia will never be better than it is today, that they will always live down to their worst historical traditions. And I will acknowledge there is a tremendous amount of evidence for that proposition, maybe more evidence for that proposition. Although, by the way, it has been used by people who therefore, who, who take that as a given and therefore want to accommodate ourselves to Putin. Because Russia, we can't expect anything better from Russia and we must be realistic and deal with Russia as it is. Which means accepting Russia's authoritarianism as permanent and unchangeable. And as a corollary of that view, by the way, these, a certain group of these kinds of realists are eager to do deals with Moscow about Ukraine. They don't put it exactly that way, although sometimes they do, but that is what is meant. Now, not all pessimists about Russia are ready to give up on Russia's victims, but be careful as you go through the American foreign policy community, because there are a lot of people who are indifferent to Putin's aggression and believe that after Putin, it will be the same as Putin or worse. But there is a second group, a second school of thought to which I myself adhere, which is that Russia is capable of a better future. Now I admit the pessimists have a lot of evidence and maybe more. However, discontinuity in Russian history has been the rule ever since Brezhnev. Brezhnev when I was in the Soviet Union in the early 1980s, the story was that after Brezhnev, it would be worse. And therefore we must accommodate ourselves to Brezhnev. After Brezhnev, it turned out to be Gorbachev. After Gorbachev, it turned out to be Yeltsin. After Yeltsin, it was Putin. Discontinuities. It may, in Russian imperial history, 19th century, the pattern seemed to be that Russian backwardness at home and aggression abroad went together, but when checked, you often had a period of reform. Alexander the First, reaction, uh, Alexander the First, progress, more progressive, Nicholas the First, reactionary, gets into confrontation with the West over Crimea, and his, he does poorly, and his successor is a reformer. I'm being crude. And, and generalizing, and I understand that, but we should not rule out the possibility of a better Russia, Russian leadership emerging after Putin, particularly if we resist Putin now. And if people like Hanna Hopko are steering Ukraine policy, imagine the impact on Russians if Ukraine succeeds.
it will be fatal to Putinism. Fatal to Putinism. Good for Russia and fatal to Putinism. So that's my thought. I admit I am on the optimistic side. I further admit that there is a massive amount of evidence to counter it. But the formative experience in my professional life is contending with people who thought that the Iron Curtain was eternal, that the Baltics would never be independent, that Ukrainian independence was irresponsible and ridiculous. And here we are. So I am not going to start talking about what cannot happen after my own experience, my own experience over the past generation. Herman, can I, can I, I longer that we got four minutes and I'm going to give, uh, summarize the, the many questions that came in and maybe if each of the three of you take a little bite, but try to hold it to a minute and a half each. Uh, one question had to do with uh, what, how do we handle uh, Germany being too friendly with uh, uh, Russia? Uh, what other concrete steps should we take? What's been missed that hasn't already been said? Uh, can we really have faith that Biden's simply going to say nice things but not do concrete things? And are sanctions uh, effective? So, Adrian, why don't you start out? Take a. I'll I'll take it on from the from the from the uh, we have the sanctions uh, uh, guru uh, uh, in Dan Fried here, so I I don't want to tread on him, but I do want to make one point, which I which I urge upon Ukrainians as well. Sanctions just because of Russia's actions to Ukraine are in, are an insufficient argument. I think the basic argument is that. Russia in the predictable future will be an authoritarian aggressive state that violates international law broadly. And, uh, and that it is in the interests of the democratic world that the resources and the level of economic development of Russia be lower than it can possibly, as low as it can possibly be through the effect of sanctions. Now, if sanctions have minimally the effect of one and a half percent that means in about 40 or 50 years, Russia's GDP will be roughly half of what it is today. And do we not want to see a smaller Russian economy that then has fewer resources for the projection of power? So the small incrementalism that sanctions affect should be an important argument in terms of the long-term approach uh, to Russia. And that ar argument is rarely made. It's always about a specific conduct of Russia at a specific given moment. But the global strategic aim of ha having a smaller Russian economy as a means of controlling Russia's projection of power in the decades to come should be an important component of how we, as friends of Ukraine, argue the issue as well as our own uh, uh, Ukraine-based uh, causes. So that's that's my contribution. Okay, Hannah? So, uh... I think that it's um, um, really important to think about the future. And of course, in 10 years, I'll be 50 almost tomorrow. I have 39 years or will be having 39 years old. And thinking about next decade, 2030. Of course, when I'll be 50 years old, I want to look at my daughter. She suffered a lot as many Ukrainian children, especially the victim of Russian aggression. Uh, so, and to say that all our struggle, uh, we resulted in like membership of, of NATO. And I truly believe, and I'm optimist, that in 2029, all of us will be sitting in Lutsk uh, Zamok, Lutsk Castle, celebrating 600th anniversary. Uh, because in uh, 1429, there was a big gathering of royal dynasties of Europe. Uh, almost 600 years ago. So we will be sitting in Lutsk with the presence of uh, Secretary General of NATO and celebrating Ukraine's uh, membership in this uh, important global alliance. And believe me, uh, by protecting and helping Ukraine, uh, the West is protecting yourself. And also one day, I'm under, now I'm under the sanction list of Russian Federation, but I'm sure I will be, we'll be visiting 
especially six republics of Idel Ural, Povolzhia, as a head of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the map of six republic of Povolzhia, Idel Ural, this map was in my office in the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. And I have a lot of uh, people there suffering from Putinism and uh, Putin's regime. So we have to liberate Russian citizens and national minority group from this authoritarian regime. And also success of Ukraine matters not just for Rush democratization of Russia and helping our neighbors like Armenia, Kazakhstan, and many others from post-Soviet countries, uh, Belarus. And also it's important to counter countering Chinese expansionism. So I think Ukraine democratic transformation and success of Ukraine matters for the West to stop the attacks of authoritarian regime, which, which are using dirty money, strategic corruption, uh, hybrid uh, instruments like cybersecurity attacks. So let's be optimistic. And uh, I dare to invite you to Lutsk in 10 years, and I'll do my best to push Ukrainian reformers in parliament. I have a lot of friends from different political factions, from Sluhana Rodu, Volos, European Solidarity, from government like uh, Yulia Laputina and many others. So we will do our homework. And also we hope like in diplomacy, there is a reciprocal principle. We will also receive a very good signal from your side and it will help us to speed up uh, the reform process in Ukraine. Thank you. Last word to Ambassador Fried and then I'll go directly to Walter. And thanks everybody for a great panel. Um, this is a great discussion. I think it's important to look, I think we're discussing the right issues. We need, we Americans need to hear from the Ukrainians about what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we need to do more of. I think that after the last four years, um, American policy toward Ukraine is going to be far more consistent, far more supportive, and it will not be a return to the, the Obama administration. It will be a return to the best sides of the Obama administration without some of the disheartening debates that happened internally, uh, the results of which we see. I think much will depend on Ukraine and what people can do there, but they will not do it alone. Secondly, I think the Europeans, I think Lavrov's trashing of Burrell has made it, mm. has encouraged the Europeans to think in tougher ways about the Russians, not completely. And I know there's Nord Stream 2, which is worthy of a, of a full discussion, but the center of gravity is changing. And the American, the, the American administration needs to use that opportunity to nail down common approaches. And I think we can do it. Thank you. Pardon me? Herman. Just, just thanks, thank everybody for their participation. And I know we're running tight, so I won't talk longer. It goes to you, Walter. Thank you very much, Herman. And I just uh, wanted to uh, complete this by saying, uh, Herman, I'm going to invite this entire panel in 2029 to lose for security dialogue. <laughs> 19 or 20. <laughs> this way. <laughs> Thank you very much for your idea, Panya. Anya. <laughs> I think it will be much more guaranteed than the Budapest Memorandum. So better to be in the NATO than to receive extra Budapest Memorandum. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for this panel. It was a wonderful panel. I would have let it go on for another hour because it really was, and the questions were also interesting. But uh, we now, uh, having thanked the uh, panel, we now move on to the next, um, the next issue uh, as important, and that is how, to, uh, how might the, uh, the Biden administration or the new administration react um, and, and help with the uh, question of uh, external aggression against Ukraine. And to take, uh, take the lead on that, I 
I, it could have been Melinda or 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 Master Herbst. I'm not sure who. Um, Melinda, are you or is, is Master Herbst? No, I'll be moderating, Walter. Okay, and thank you. And Melinda, you will you will be in as lead discussing. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, man. All right. All right. Um, Walter, thank you for organizing this event and say thank you for inviting the Eurasia Center tag team to participate. Uh, we have, you know, Moscow has been waging a, a military campaign against Ukraine since February of 2014. Although it's obviously engaging in influence, excuse me, influence operations since Ukraine became independent. Mm -hmm. And the great danger that Moscow's current war on Ukraine presents to Ukraine and to the West is something we want to highlight on this panel. So I will not speak myself. I will serve as a moderator asking some questions. And I think we can start with um, my friend Alexander Lufinenko to talk about the challenge of the war uh, that Moscow is waging and what Ukraine is doing about it and his initial thoughts about what the United States might be able to do, the Biden administration. First of all, I'm very thankful for organizers for this brilliant, uh, brilliant confer conference, because now we have a unique opportunity to listen many voices. Uh, and I am really thankful for Hanna for your very interesting idea about security dialogue in Lutsk, <laughs> in historical places. Uh, which uh, participation of uh, our friends from uh, Kazan et other, and others. Unfortunately, I have to be much more heavy footed and I will to start my uh, presentation from the very, very simple things. From my personal point of view, we have in our security dialogue, we have to concentrate and do on the very, very practical issues, such as uh, cyber preparation and cyber development and uh, signing defense cooperation agreement. Because we have a many very interesting and very important uh, uh, tr uh, tracks for communicate uh, for cooperation, but from my point of view, now it's time to combine all of uh, all of them and create the uh, so how it say a roof, a common roof, a common umbrella for all these ways and formalize it. It's a first of all, it's for the first thing. The second uh, thing, I strongly support the idea of uh, NATO, uh, joining NATO. Ukraine uh, strategic course, which uh, now is a part of the constitution is NATO in your uh, membership. But from my point of view, if we are thinking about concrete and uh, middle and short term uh, perspective, it would be great at least to consider issue on the main uh, non-NATO, outside NATO ally of the US. It would be very interesting and allows us to achieve some new opportunities. This is a third one. From my point of view, it would be not only, not only great and not only useful for Ukraine, but for all Black Sea region uh, to enhance, to strengthen American naval, naval and uh, uh, Air Force presence in the Black uh, Sea. Now, we, this presence in maybe one of the most important factors which counter in Russia, which deter uh, her from more active 
and uh, more aggressive policy in this region. Uh, it's uh, what I want to say, I wanted to say about strategic levels. On the other levels, uh, I want to insist on the importance of improvement of interoperability with US and Ukraine security and defense sector organizations. Uh, for us, it's extremely important to maintain and development uh, cooperation with uh, U US agencies in the direction of reshaping doct uh, doctrinal level of Ukrainian security and defense uh, sector with accordance of NATO standards, or if I were honest, with American standards. Mm. We need to, I am so sorry, I tried to, to be frank uh, with you. Uh, we have a very interesting and important lessons for them, we paid much lessons of fighting Russian from 2014, and we have to use these uh, lessons and uh, uh, sharing these ideas with uh, Americans. We need to strengthen our cooperation in the military education and training sphere. It's extremely important to train our military and security personnel, both in Ukraine and the US so as well. From my personal point of view, uh, bigger presence in our armed forces and security force, uh, security organization, people who studied, studied and trained in the US and other Western countries, such as Great Britain uh, and others, would be extremely important for changing uh, mood of our operation and changing the organizational uh, culture of our um, forces. People must see a difference. People must see uh, the world. The third one, uh, it's extremely important for us to uh, expanding number and scale of joint military drills in Ukrainian uh, in the Ukrainian territory, uh, joint uh, drills. It's not only about training. It's not only about preparation. Not only development of our military capacity, but it's about uh, deterrence of Russia as well. American presence on the, our uh, soil, it's extremely important. This uh, third direction, military technical cooperation. Uh, from my point of view, now it's a uh, time to uh, for evaluation and revise of existing capabilities and needs for more targeting and effective military US military using of US military aid. We are very thankful for 125 million dollar of American uh, help aid in this year. But from uh, my point, uh, my uh, point of view, we have enough resources for improvement, uh, effectiveness, and I'm I hope, uh, and we uh, I, I, sorry for this uh, approach, uh, expanding number of these um, uh, eight. From our point of view, it's first of all very important in the air defense, naval warfare, communications, surveillance, and other spheres. From our point of view, we need to improve protection of transfer technologies. It's extremely important for us. It's extre extremely important uh, expanding uh, American uh, investments in Ukrainian military industrial complex. 
uh, we have a extremely difficult uh, experience with uh, foreign investments in this complex. Uh, motor siege, unfortunately, motor siege case in one of the most sensitive and known from my point of view, the best uh, cases. And from our, and I think the expanding of American and other Western uh, investments would be a real uh, solution for this situation. Uh, for us, important improvement of Ukrainian participation in the U.S. foreign military sales uh, program. Very interesting and uh, very promising uh, direction in joint financing of defense procur procurement in Ukraine. Ukrainians funds plus U.S. government programs like FMF, Section 333 three, three authority to build capacity, etc. Issue of improving of C2 system uh, in Ukraine and other structures of Ukrainian armed forces and security for, uh, forces. And uh, five, uh, five direction which I want to insist. It's an uh, issue of exchanging of information, including uh, on uh, defense and security issues, including sensitive information and information such as maritime and air surveillance with uh, real, near real time uh, data. We need to improve our opportunities uh, for protecting information. Uh, but from other point of view, it's very important to expand uh, the number and amount of this exchange. Uh, this exchange, this sharing is uh, one of the best opportunities for, for real for improvement of trust in security sphere. And I hope uh, we have enough uh, opportunities for deepening this trust. Thank you again so much for your attention. Now, Alexander, thank you for that comprehensive presentation. I now like to turn it over to my other friend, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges to offer perspective from the US side. Ambassador, thank you. And, and Walter, Thank you for uh, the privilege to be a part of this. Uh, I love your events. I always feel like it's right on the edge of just coming apart. I mean, it's, it uh, keeps me on the edge of my seat. And uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm grateful to be included in this. There's, uh, uh, it's interesting, it's exciting. And there's people that are passionate about this, uh, about Ukraine and about uh, the relationship between the United States and Ukraine. And so thank you. Um, let me say first to, uh, to my friends from Ukraine, uh, 12 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed this year in just the last uh, two months, 12. And this is under a ceasefire. And so that's 12 families, um, 12 mothers, uh, 12 soldiers that have comrades. Uh, it, it's terrible. Uh, during during uh, a so-called ceasefire. Um, I read the OSCE special monitoring mission report every day to see what they say. And every day they talk about 100 to 150 ceasefire violations in the Luhansk and Donetsk uh, uh, oblasts. Every day. It's incredible. And it's clear, uh, I'm sure many of you saw the report just a couple of days ago, that the uh, Special monitoring mission was stopped by the so-called separatists <clears throat> that they uh, were not allowed to do their mission. They were held up for several hours. It's clear that uh, these knuckleheads feel zero pressure mm -hmm. to apply, to allow the uh, very brave women and men of the OSCE special monitoring mission to do their job. Zero pressure. Uh, that means they get zero pressure from the Kremlin. And maybe even worse, I mean, that's to be expected. What's worse, they get zero pressure from Germany and France. Uh, Berlin and Paris have been a colossal failure 
at uh, holding the Kremlin accountable for what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, they are two of the key nations for the Mets process. And yet, um, I don't feel not one, uh, one bit of pressure uh, from them on the Kremlin or on the so-called separatists to live up to their, uh, their agreements and as part of the Minsk process. I'm not against Minsk. We, we need a, uh, a, a diplomatic framework, uh, but so far uh, what has happened has been completely unsatisfactory and unsatisfying. And uh, I think it is time for the United States to step in to become a leading member of the Minsk process uh, to, to do more than just uh, put lip service on all this. And I think Ambassador Kurt Volker has called for that for quite some time. Uh, and I hope that the Biden administration will establish the role again of a special uh, envoy specifically for this. And I hope that uh, uh, we will get into the immense process again. Yeah, it's not all bad. Uh, I was very pleased that our president designated Ukraine, Ukrainian sovereignty as a priority for the United States in his phone call, his first phone call with President Putin. That means Crimea, that means Donbass, sovereignty, uh, a priority for the United States. And of course, everybody that's listening knows that uh, what goes into whatever the president says, whether it's a speech or a uh, phone call there's a huge fight to make sure to get your points into that phone call, your talking points. And so the fact that that made it into the president's phone call uh, as a priority uh, to me is very heartening. Now, if that's all it is, if that's just a phone call, then that'll be a colossal disappointment. Uh, but I, like uh, Ambassador Dan Fried said earlier, uh, that he's an optimist, I too am an optimist and, and I'm hopeful here. Um, the good news about the president saying that Ukrainian sovereignty is a priority uh, is that that means there will have to be a Black Sea strategy because Ukraine is not an island and Ukraine's sovereignty is directly connected to everything else that goes on with its neighbors and in the Black Sea region. So the, the administration will have to develop a uh, um, uh, strategy for the Black Sea region if we're serious about Ukrainian sovereignty, about Crimea and Donbass. Now, uh, I believe that the great power competition, and you know, some people don't like this phrase, uh, maybe they think it has a negative connotation, but I, I believe that great power competition prevents great power conflict. If you are competing in all domains, diplomacy, information, uh, an economy, not just in military, you are telling the other side that we care about this and that we're not just going to sit back and you do whatever you want to do. And I think that the United States, even though we have a long line of excellent ambassadors who have served in Kiev, we haven't always demonstrated as a government, and I include the Congress in this, that the Black Sea region was of strategic importance to us. That's what's got to change. We're talking about not just Ukraine, but Georgia, Turkey, Romania, Moldova, Bulgaria, that the whole region is important to us and we have to compete in all those. If we do that, then I think there's a lot less likelihood of the Kremlin making a terrible miscalculation and thinking that we don't care, uh, which is exactly what they accurately predicted that we would not do anything if they went into Crimea. They, they knew that the West would not do anything because we had not competed there. And so that's what's got to change. Now, when I talk about uh, competition, I, I see the Black Sea as the cauldron of competition. This is the place. The Baltic region is important for sure, but I see Kaliningrad actually as a liability for the Kremlin. We've got um, so many allied nations up there in the Baltic Sea, plus two very strong partners, Finland and Sweden. It's a different geography. Uh, in the Black Sea region. We have three NATO allies. We have three partners. Um, the relationship between Turkey and the United States is in as bad a condition as I've seen in a long time. That's not good for the Black Sea region. We have to fix that. Um, the, uh, the access 
uh, through the Straits is controlled completely by Turkey under Montreux Convention. And frankly, um, it gives the Black Sea Fleet the uh, numerical advantage always. So, th so it's a different set of conditions. And I believe that the Black Sea is more important to the Kremlin than the Baltic Sea. It's their launching pad for everything they do in Syria, in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Africa. Uh, it's how they influence uh, activities and operations and security in the Caucasus. And it's how they influence everything in the uh, Balkans. So the so Black Sea is essential for the Kremlin. That, I'm not against the Kremlin being able to have, uh, to do commerce there and where it's their territory to normal sovereignty things. Uh, but I'm completely against what they do when it violates the sovereignty of others or disrupts or prevents economic development of countries in the region. But we haven't competed there well enough yet. So what, what does that competition look like? First of all, in diplomacy, uh, I've mentioned the Minsk process already. The United States should dive into the Minsk process as one of the uh, lead members. Uh, we need Germany and France to be responsible to uh, uh, put pressure on the Kremlin. I, I do believe that Berlin is the only capital that can influence uh, Kremlin behavior. And unfortunately, they have been reluctant to do it. I was appalled, like many of you, when President Steinmeier, the president of the German Federal Republic, made this comment about Nord Stream 2 that like, well, you have to understand, you know, we're responsible for the death of millions of Russians and uh, you know, there's a history here. I, I couldn't believe he, I can believe it, but I was appalled that he said it. And of course it actually was millions of Ukrainians, not millions of Russians uh, that, that died uh, during the second world war. Uh, and, and so the whole narrative that comes from Berlin is, is uh, unsatisfactory. And, and this is where the United States has got to put pressure on Berlin to put pressure on the Kremlin, the French, I'm sorry, uh, our oldest ally mm. for the United States, but they would sell Ukraine and Georgia in a minute if it meant improved relationship for them uh, with the Kremlin. Oh. And so this is where if the Biden administration is serious about Ukrainian sovereignty uh, as a priority, and if the Biden administration is serious about working with allies and about working with the European Union, then uh, there should be so much pressure on Paris and Berlin to do more uh, to, uh, otherwise we won't be able to do this. The, uh, when you compete in the information domain, this narrative out, that's out there, I'm, I'm, I live in Frankfurt. It's an incredible city, great place. Uh, Germany, our most important ally. But I hear so many Germans talk about, well, you know, Crimea was always Russian. Um, or we have to maintain the dialogue. We can't do anything that, that threatens the dialogue or we're guilty from the war. It's unbelievable. And so we've got to change the narrative because this, this is so easy for the Russians otherwise. Or, or when we talk about the separatists, no, they're not separatists. These are Russian officers, Russian commanders, Russian logistics, everything that happens in the Donbass only happens because of what the Kremlin says and enables. And because the Kremlin does not allow the OSCE to do its job. So this, again, I think this is where Berlin and Paris have got to step up. In the military domain, uh, obviously, uh, as I've mentioned, we're limited on what we can do from a, a naval standpoint. Um, uh, is, uh, it's, all, it's a fact, and I'm not against Montreux. Mon Montreux actually can help um, as long as everybody else is doing everything that they can. We, Montreux is not the problem. We don't use up 50% of the available days that we, the West and NATO could be using in the Black Sea. The fact that we don't have more US Navy, Royal Navy, German Navy, Italian Navy and others in the Black Sea is because there's not enough resources to do everything and the Black Sea is not a high enough priority. That, that, that's simple, that's all there is to it. And so we have to change the priority of the Black Sea region and then the, our great Navy will respond and they'll start putting ships in there and, and, uh, and doing more exercises. I am proud that the United States has continued to provide military equipment and aid to Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, the, uh, 
uh, and the fact that it's going to increase. And I know Ambassador Herbst and Melinda Herring have been leading the charge on trying to get even more in there. This is important. Um, occasionally, you'll hear somebody on Capitol Hill or maybe in the Pentagon say, well, I'm not sure that Ukrainian Ministry of Defense can absorb more. <laughs> That's completely false. They absolutely can absorb more. But Ukraine has a responsibility also. Ukraine must comply with American law about um, transparency and demonstrating where everything goes. So this is not just about ships, Lindley's just turning over stuff. This is about Ukraine uh, fulfilling its responsibility as well. I do think that uh, things like counterfire radar are extremely helpful, both in terms of early warning as well as being able to pinpoint location for where rockets and artillery are coming from. I think that anti-ship missiles, truck mounted or ground mounted systems that can force Black Sea Fleet uh, to stay away from uh, Ukrainian territorial waters is something that I would uh, prioritize. I think that continuing to improve the military medical health care uh, from the point of injury, how Ukrainian soldiers who are in, injured or wounded all the way back to the hospitals do you have the right evacuation processes and capabilities? I know that the women and men uh, healthcare professionals know how to do it, but do they have the facilities and resources they need? I think this is something that deserves uh, financial support. And then secure communications. Uh, we, we have seen what the Russians are capable of doing with their drones. They can intercept, they can jam, and they can target. When somebody's talking on a phone or on a radio that's not secure, they are going to get killed. And so secure communications are an important capability. Let me close by, with this. Um, economic competition. Ukraine has got to make itself more attractive to Western business. Because what will happen when German business starts investing lots of money in Ukraine, when the Dutch start investing lots of money in Ukraine, when the French put an investment there, when the United States puts investment there, then the parliament or the Congress or the government, they start paying attention to what's going on because you got lots of money invested there. If there's no investment, if there's no economic investment, then the governments are not going to uh, prioritize uh, holding the Kremlin accountable. I think that the port of Crimea, ever since President Poroshenko said, all the ports are closed. All the different ports around Crimea, they're all closed. He did that after Russia's illegal annexation. Well, to me then, that means that every vessel that sails out of Yalta or Sevastopol or any other port in Crimea is illegal. It's contraband. So no European port should allow any vessel to come there. No uh, maritime insurance company should insure any vessel that sails out of a Crimean port. This may seem like a small, tedious kind of thing, but it's an example of how you can put pressure on the Kremlin if we don't recognize that those ports are lawful ports. If, if you accept a vessel that sails from Yalta or Sevastopol and it comes to your port, you have de facto legitimized Russia's claim to Crimea. So this is the kind of comprehensive approach we've got to take to compete in every single domain. Walter, thanks again for the privilege uh, to be a part of this. Now, thank you very much for that comprehensive um, rundown of the security situation. I'm gonna take this in a slightly different direction right now. Uh, Alexander spoke about the need for dealing with corruption. He spoke about the need for increased US investment in the Ukrainian military industrial area. And of course, that requires dealing with the massive corruption, which we still see with Ukrobron Prom. Um, General Hodges spoke about the needing, need for foreign direct investment, which also calls for dealing with uh, corruption. And of course, in the previous panel, we heard about the dangers of Russian influence through media controlled by uh, Moscow friendly figures and also through corruption. So I'd like to ask Melinda to address the national security aspects of dealing with reform, fighting against corruption in Ukraine. Melinda, over to you. 
Thank you, Ambassador Herbst. Thank you, Walter, for the invitation to be here among so many friends. And I definitely agree with Ben that your seminars are like graduate school. You never know what's gonna happen and they're, they're always very exciting. So thank you. Um, Ambassador Herbst, before I turn to your question, I, I don't wanna repeat uh, Ben's excellent list, but there's a few things, uh, a, a minor thing that I would also put on, on the wish list. Um, as the US thinks about helping uh, Ukrainian troops, I think it's important to say that we need to make sure that uh, female vets have all, and female um, military officers have all the right equipment we need. Uh, I, I know that there is continuing need for equipment that fits smaller bodies, uh, that women um, need access to doctors on the front line, and they also need uniforms in the military academy that are designed for women. So those are needs that I hear over and over again when I talk to that community, and I'd like to add those uh, to the list for consideration. Now to your question. There is a direct and strong relationship between the need uh, for the United States to push forward and defend Ukraine and also to press forward on its reforms. Ukraine has to do both. Uh, it has to win in the East and it has to win the war against corruption. And we know that. Uh, and I, th I think that there is uh, some interesting things to be looking at right now. The SBU is uh, the reform there. There's a bill in the Rada right now that is finally moving forward. This is the first time that, that the SBU uh, it, it reform is actually moving forward. And, and I, I would recommend that you take a look at our, there's an excellent blog by Ambassador Pfeiffer and Sasha Ustinova, an MP with Holos on our blog now. And it details uh, the whole process. But in brief, this, this reform bill is uh, has passed in the first reading and it would eliminate the anti-corruption and organized crime units of the SBU it would reduce the number of employees from 27,000 to 17,000 in four years, which is a good thing because Ukraine has the largest security service in Europe. And it would reduce, uh, as it reduces the number of employees, it could lead to increased salaries for those top-notch employees. So it, there's a lot of work being done on this. Sasha told me that there's over 2,000 amendments. It's not a done deal, but this is something that the U.S. really needs to encourage and watch. So that's something that's moving in the positive direction. But just to be very explicit, uh, Ukraine has a lot of cleanup work to do. And in the last year, things really went in the, in the wrong direction, especially on the anti-corruption institutions. So if Ukraine uh, wants, or sorry, if the United States wants Ukraine to win in the East and we want to offer them all of these, all the, the necessary equipment that, that Ben uh, went through, we have to continue uh, to work with them on SBU reform and anti-corruption reform and all the reforms uh, that were discussed on the previous panel as well. Uh, one other point, uh, I want to be positive and, and uh, give Ukraine uh, credit where credit is, is, is due. So President Zelensky recently slapped on sanctions on Medvedchuk. Awesome. I think that, that this crowd is very supportive of that. Yesterday, there was an interesting article in the Financial Times or the day before, uh, and it quoted a high-level Ukrainian official who said that there's more to come. Amen. Let's see more of that. Let's, let's go after, um, let, let's see the Ukrainian government go after more oligarchs. I think that's something that the Biden administration will be watching as well. Uh, finally, last point, uh, Walter, on Friday, the Atlantic Council is going to be putting out a new report and we would love to have you and your crowd join us. It's called Biden and Ukraine, a strategy for the new administration. And it has lots of details on how the US can help on the domestic side, on the defense side, and then also how to restore the, our important relationship between President Biden and President Zelensky. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Linda, much. Thank you very much for that. Um, Steve Blank is, is discussing for this event. Uh, he always has important and interesting things to say. So Steve, over to you. Thank you, John. I want to thank Walter for inviting me to this August to set, uh, collection of uh, luminaries on Ukraine. It's always a pleasure to speak on this and you always learn something new. Uh, I myself have an article coming out about this where I, I pointed out that while the Ukrainian government has made it clear that it wants to be given a definite trajectory to NATO membership, as we have talked about here, the administration is not ready to commit itself. That's very clear. For, if, you read, if you compare the readout between uh, Secretary Blinken and Minister Kuleva's uh, statements, it's very clear. Now, General Hodges has talked about the Black Sea, which is a subject close to our heart, uh, which we've discussed many times together. I see NATO as beginning to have a Black Sea strategy. There are more ships going in. There are more challenges from the Russians to those ships, as you can read about in the papers. 
there is also the provision by the United States now of $125 million and Mark 6 patrol boats to Ukraine. This needs to be intensified and stepped up because the Black Sea strategy, which we have talked about, needs to go into areas that is not that are not just simply military. That is challenging the Russian hegemony in the Black Sea, refusing to recognize Crimea and giving Ukraine military assistance. It also means pushing Ukraine, as uh, Alexander has talked about, to develop energy capabilities, which it has, that could then, that's Vladimir Putin calling me up, uh, which it has I to- I uh, wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, he, they listen to everything we do. So uh, Ukraine has the capacity, even under the truncated circumstances now, to provide its own energy for itself, to be energy self-sufficient. Beyond that, it could even export to its neighbors. And the pipelines are there. You just reverse the direction. Uh, now Ukraine is getting its gas from, say, Poland and Slovakia and so on, because the Russians are not coming through. Uh, it's Russian gas that has gone to Europe and is coming back through Central and Eastern Europe. Ukraine has this opportunity, therefore, to ex provide for itself and to export to other countries. Because the Black Sea is critical to Russia as well, not just simply as a military thoroughfare and as a uh, point of departure for its power projection in, Ukraine, in Mediterranean and Middle East. It is vital as an oil thoroughfare. Turkstream, and I just published on this, Turkstream is a, a program that is intended to dominate, subvert Balkan governments and tie Turkey closer to Russia. Hmm. The extent that we can provide a viable economic alternative through Ukraine. Hmm. And that's not even talking about the gas and oil that the Russians stole seven years ago hmm. when they uh, conquered Ukraine, uh, Crimea. Then we have attenuated and weakened Russia's ability to dominate the Black Sea and the littoral states. This is particularly true, for, by the way, about Bulgaria, which has always been an outlier. It has refused really to do anything substantive to threaten Russian interests. And, uh, and as many analysts have pointed out, its energy in industry is dominated by Russia. And this brings me to the point about corruption. It is essential if Ukraine is going to get into NATO and is going to continue to command bipartisan support, which Dan Fried talked about in the earlier panel, in the US Congress and supporting the Biden administration and hopefully in the administration that comes in in 2025, it must uproot the corruption. There is no other alternative. The corruption not only undermines democratic governance within Ukraine, it of course renders Ukraine vulnerable to multiple forms of Russian penetration and subversion. And this has to be uh, uh, challenged. The energy area is one of the areas where it is most felt. I've talked, and, and normally uh, this has been at, uh, when we had the conference without having to do Zoom, uh, to businessmen who Walter would bring over who want to invest in Ukraine. The desire is there. The personnel in Ukraine are there. You have educated, high-tech capabilities that are terrific. But what you have is a government that continues to obstruct reform in many ways and only intermittently takes on the major male factors like Medvedchuk and uh, Kolomieski and so on. This has to be changed and it's going to change I think with this administration. The Biden administration knows Ukraine. The key players starting with the president himself know Ukraine intimately. They know the problems that Alexander and General Hodges have talked about today, as well as the issues that have come up in the previous panels and will come up subsequently. They have been on the ground with Ukraine and they know this. They are fully engaged with Ukraine. That is why President Biden spoke to Putin about it. And you know, we need to remember that this is a complete sea change from the previous administration, where the president believed that Ukraine was just simply a bunch of corrupt guys who were trying to undermine him. And 
and got himself impeached over his machinations involving Ukraine. This administration is not going to allow Ukrainian corruption to uh, stop the trajectory of Ukraine's movement, but Ukraine will not get into NATO until and unless, or the EU, until and unless it takes on these people, whether it's in the energy sphere, in defense industry, which is still not nearly uh, subjected to enough reform, and does this consistently. It can't be, oh, the United States is demanding that we take on a reform. Okay, today we're going to whack a mole. We're going to hit Mr. Kolomiesky or, or some other oligarch. Uh, but when, you know, when the heat's off, we go back to business as usual. Business as usual won't cut it. And this administration, I think, is admirably situated to make that very clear to the Ukrainian government because of its profound knowledge and engagement with Ukraine and its sympathy for Ukraine, which has been demonstrated uh, during the Obama administration and in private and other contacts among the uh, members of the administration with Ukrainian government. So the panelists have identified really where we need to go forward. We need to have defense industry reform. The Ukrainian defense strategy process needs to be further reformed, put on a NATO standard in practice, not just in rhetoric. The United States and Europe need to continue to support Ukraine, and we need to put pressure on our European allies to do so. And I think one way we can do this is to hit, is to take out Nord Stream 2. Um, I'm appalled that there seems to be an effort to uh, allow Nord Stream 2 to get by because it's going, it will offend the Germans. Quite frankly, I'm not upset about offending the Germans. Uh, Mr. Steinmeier showed that the, uh, too many people in Germany have no real understanding of where German interest lies. And I think that needs to be brought home to them, that you can't lie in bed with the Russians and expect that uh, things are going to get better in Europe. This is just an end around so that German business can make a lot of profit, but it gives Germany also downstream distribution, in uh, Russia, downstream distribution rights in Germany and in Central Europe and it undermines Ukraine in, in many different ways. So to conclude my remarks, we have just heard very distinguished and knowledgeable speakers tell us what the agenda needs to be of reform in energy, defense industry, defense planning, US aid to uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian political reform, pressure on Europe to support Ukraine, and US diplomatic involvement in a big way in current efforts to find peace in Ukraine. I don't think Minsk is going to be salvageable. I think we need something beyond Minsk, but it's not going to happen until this administration weighs in. And I think that's what ne needs to come next. Thank you. Steve, thank you. All right, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, I have questions of my own, but I'm happy to go with audience questions. You could put them in the chat or for that matter in the Q&A. We have a question from Mark Timnicki to all the panelists regarding the Normandy format. How might the Americans join the format as an official member? If this is not possible, how might the US pursue diplomacy, uh, continued role as an advisor to Ukraine? Uh, but I would say continued role as influencing the negotiations, which I think the United States did both when Toria Newland was assistant secretary in the late Obama administration and when Kurt Volker was the special envoy. So let's start with, with um, Alexander um, to answer this question. But first unmute yourself, don't do what I do. First of all, thank you so much. I, from my point of view, it's too difficult to expand Normandy format, but it would be great to remember about uh, Geneva mm. format, in which uh, we have Americans, uh, EU, and Russians. Maybe it could be very, very interesting approach. The second one, from my point of view, it would be great if the US can uh, consider the issue of special of uh, recreation, uh, the post of uh, special representative. Uh, for for regular uh, for uh, conflict mitigation, uh, 
in uh, but from my point of view the most important to expand american presence and american uh, participation in uh, all uh, in all format which it's possible to for countering russia and to find out solution between uh, russia in Ukraine about restoring inter uh, territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine, about uh, mitigation uh, threats, and about creation a new form of coexistence. And uh, I want to say a very small, uh, a few words about corruption. I do, in Ukraine, I do agree that it's uh, fighting corruption. It's an extremely important issue. Even more from my point of view, it would be great to say not only about, not only about fighting combat corruption, but about expanding of uh, institutional capacity of Ukrainian state and public institution. It's, ex uh, from my point of view, it's a vital issue for the Ukrainian future. Thank you. Ben, over to you. Thanks, sir. So, uh, of course, you've got two different sort of things with the uh, uh, Minsk process, it's, it's Russia, Ukraine, and OSCE. In the Normandy format, it's Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and uh, France. So both, both of these tracks would require a, agreement by everybody else that's there. That, that's going to be difficult. I agree with Alexander that it, it'll be very difficult. We, we can't just show up no matter who we sent, even if we reached out there and, and got Ambassador John Harris. Our leading diplomat and said, "John, go in there and fix this." <laughs> uh, the the other parties are not likely to agree to it. So um, this is why we've got to come up with leverage over our German and French allies to get them to uh, find a way for us to uh, be able to participate. Um, I think that the OSCE is a mechanism that is underutilized. Uh, we had a very good ambassador, Dan Baer, that was there for three or four years, a very good ambassador, uh, but he's gone. And at the end of the day, if the president of the United States says this is a priority, then that means he has to put his personal uh, weight behind it. He's got to put resources behind it and it's got to occupy uh, time and space bandwidth with all the relevant parties. When I was a commander, if I said something was a priority, I personally was there and I dumped resources on it and I put my best people on it. So that's what the president's got to do if he's serious about this being <laughs> a priority. And I would recommend that, sure that we have a dynamite diplomat at OSCE, that we have a terrific diplomat in Kiev and that we pick a terrific diplomat uh, to be the special envoy. But also, the, the ambassador to Berlin and Paris cannot be major donors. They need to be professional diplomats that everybody in those countries would go like, holy shit, they're serious. They, they, they just sent their best woman to be the ambassador in Paris or, or, or in Berlin. Uh, then I'll believe that this really is uh, a priority. Thank you. Uh, okay, Melinda, your shot. Can, can I uh, engage Ben a little bit more? He just said something really interesting. Uh, Lieutenant General Hodges, how do you uh, increase the pressure on the French and Germans? Do you, do you have any ideas on that? And why do you think the OSCE is valuable? So when I, I spent a lot of time in Kiev and talked to people, uh, especially Ukrainians, they, they, they are very suspicious of the OSCE because there's Russian uh, diplomats involved in their, the Russian diplomats are constantly uh, inserting uh, junk into the reports and diminishing real findings. And they're a real pain in the ass. Uh, and, and you could argue that they're, they're, they're diluting the mission. So I would disagree with you a little bit about the OSCE special monitoring mission. Uh, I know that many in Ukraine are frustrated with them because uh, they, they, they feel that the, uh, the, the monitoring mission does not fully 
report everything that happens. Uh, but this, I think this is very normal and uh, expected frustration by uh, people, especially think of those soldiers out in the God dang, uh, water filled trenches and they know that they're not allowed to shoot back. They're not, I mean, Ukraine, frankly, probably um, uh, is responsible for less than 10% of the ceasefire violations. That's from OSCE, that 90% come from the other side. And so it's frustrating for Ukrainians to see their, their fellow soldiers getting killed, is for civilians to see that. But I, I believe that the special monitoring mission actually does a good job. Uh, and they just are not uh, able to go out at night. Uh, it's not safe. I mean, they're not peacekeepers. They're, they're monitors. And, and the Kremlin knows this. And, and so the Kremlin could, could fix that with one phone call from the big guy, this would be fixed, but they have no incentive to fix it. So that's, that's part of the problem there. Now, in terms of leverage on Paris and, and Berlin, um, you know, and don't take this wrong, but if the president is this super experienced, you know, master of foreign relations that we've been hearing about for the last, for the entire campaign, and frankly, that's his reputation. Well, then he probably has 20 or 30 different uh, triggers he can pull that are serious leverage on two of our oldest allies, whether it's in uh, economic or in, di in the diplomatic sphere or uh, in other places, uh, it might even just be flat out economic support. Um, you know, none of these things happens in a vacuum. And so, um, I, if I, I if I was advising the president, and my phone may ring any minute like Stevens just did, um, the uh, um, I, I would imagine that the president has people that are telling Berlin and say, look, you know, we've got all these issues with China, with Iran, with the Russians, uh, with uh, trade trade imbalance. Uh, something is going to have to give here. And, and, and there's a variety of ways they can do that. So we, the president has all the leverage he needs. He's, he's going to have to use it. And it, by the way, it, this is not a ballet. I mean, this is not going to be beautiful. Um, this, is, this, is hard, this is hard stuff. Ben, thank you. Uh, Melinda, your inner moderator has had her one shot. You want to answer the question as well? I, I agree with what Ben said. There, there's, there's no chance on Normandy. The Russians would never agree to that. We're going to have to look at other options. In addition to the options that, that Alexander and Ben named, the other option is to, to do uh, the, the sort of Toria Newland option and appoint someone who has a very uh, large position at the State Department to negotiate directly with the Russians. And you, of course, the other obvious point is you have to increase the costs on the Russians. That's what we have to do. And we have to think about that really seriously to get them to negotiate. Two excellent ideas. Steve, yes, it's your, uh, your shot. Yeah, let me let me build on this. Um, not only is, is Ben right that the Russians will veto Normandy, they will also veto uh, any attempt by the U.S. to, to join the Minsk process, too. So, we, as, as you said, we need a special ambassador for Ukraine, like Kurt Volker's position, and somebody of comparable stature and quality. And as uh, Melinda said, we need somebody leading perhaps more stature and, and uh, uh, capability to deal with the Russians directly on this and others and the race course. Well, how do you, but the point is we have to, I think, oh, get over the idea that what we're going to do is going to change Mr. Putin's behavior. What, what, we, are, what we have to do is to change the environment in which Mr. Putin acts. That means that you don't only have a Russia policy, that, you, that your Russia policy is part of a broader strategy, in this case, for having to do with European security, because Ukraine is an issue, not just of Ukrainian sec uh, security, although that's certainly true, but of European security. And unless you can knock heads in the alliance together and bring the alliance together, the Russians will not, reject, will not give up anything that they have taken in Ukraine. So the pressure has to be brought to them, upon them to raise the costs of occupation in Ukraine to such a level that they actually sit down to negotiate, which they have not done at least since 2016 or 17, if, if not before. And until then, we're spinning our wheels if we talk about the Minsk or the Normandy format. Those are useless. Thank you. Okay, uh, I just want to add in here that, uh, in fact, putting pressure on Moscow for its, and putting a cost on Moscow for its aggression in Ukraine 
is a critical part of our strategy. And I want to point out that Lydia Shevtsova came out with new statistics suggesting that sanctions that the West has imposed on Russia since 2014 have cost the Russian economy $180 billion. And of course, this is more data following the statements coming from the IMF a few years ago that those sanctions were costing the Russian economy about 1% to 1.25% of GDP per year. So th this, this is a serious, a serious part of any sensible strategy. Uh, reducing Moscow's economic basis for conducting war is a very sensible approach. All right, uh, I'd also like to uh, follow up on the notion of the special envoy for the United States. Um, Kurt Volker did an excellent job in that position, but as Melinda pointed out, um, before that in the Obama administration, Tori Newland performed the same function from her post as Assistant Secretary. Uh, just a quick, quick statement from all of you. Um, do we need to have a special envoy or can this be done via, again, a senior official taking on this portfolio? Because it does not appear that Biden administration is planning on naming a special envoy for the negotiations. Alexander, start with you. Thank you again. Thank you so much for this opportunity sharing uh, our po my point of view. And what I want to insist for us a critical, important, not even uh, pressure to Russia, but strengthening Ukraine it's uh, herself. For us, the most important Russian issue is extremely important. Russia, but Russian fate is a Russian fate. For me, and for many Ukrainians, the most important fate uh, future of Ukraine. And for us, the most important American aid for strengthening Ukrainian state, for development of, of Ukrainian economy and uh, civil society. And again, so uh, we are very thankful for American help for American aid and hope that uh, this help and it will continue and will expand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ben? Well, Ambassador, um, I like the idea of a special envoy, but it has to be a, a woman or a man that has instant name recognition that would be respected not only in Moscow and Kiev, but also Berlin and Paris, that everybody would go like, wow, they really are serious. And, and then that ambassador has to have a strategy. I mean, there has to be a strategy from the U.S. government that uh, underpins the uh, policy recommendations and the actions of the ambassador that uh, he or she is going to uh, uh, try and utilize. But in the absence of the Black Sea strategy, you could have George Washington as our special envoy and it, it just wouldn't get the job done. Um, so uh, I, I think it is, it's not uncommon for a, a, in a political, and this is not a, criticism is a, this is just a historical analysis. Uh, you got a problem, you throw it at, at a, uh, at a person it's like, okay, okay, John's going to solve my problem. And then and now I can focus on other stuff. You know, the envoy has to be my personal representative and, and he or she knows they got the full weight of the U S government and the Congress behind them to get done what needs to be done. I think about Holbrook, you know, ambassador Holbrook was not famous for uh, having a lot of friends. I mean, there was <laughs> also ego involved. Um, but I, in 95 to 97, I was the aide de camp for SACUR, General Jowan. During the whole, I, you know, the Dayton Peace Accord process, I was a major, but I got to kind of watch all this. And I remember somebody asked General Jowan one time, said, man, Holbrook, what, a, what an ego that guy has. And he goes, yeah, but you know what? If you're going to have to do what he's being asked to do, you have to have incredible self-confidence to go in there and bang heads together of Izabegovic and Milosevic and uh, Tuzman. So uh, just designate the envoy. That's not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is the strategy and then no kidding commitment by the administration with congressional support. Ben, that, that's a very important point. And let me just point out something Melinda put in the chat that Ben has actually spearheaded the whole effort to rethink the US strategy in the Black Sea region which deals with NATO vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities of our other friends 
in that region and pushing back against Moscow's aggression. And with that, let's let's finish up now with um, Melinda and Steve. Melinda? John, just a quick bureaucratic point. I don't think it makes sense to do the special envoy. The special envoy and the ambassador often are uncertain who, who does what. I think it makes more sense to do uh, a high level person at the State Department and have a top uh, US ambassador in Kiev. Uh, and it would be really helpful if that person spoke Russian or Ukrainian so they could form a relationship with Zelensky, but that's a minor point. Okay, thank you. That is an excellent one. Steve, over to you, the last word, and we'll return, oh, okay. <laughs> we'll return to Walter back on time. Thank you. Uh, the idea of appointing a special ambassador is to deal with not only Moscow, but Kiev and European allies. And again, as my colleagues have said, they need somebody of real eminence and capability. But that person can only function if there's a clear US strategy as to what we want to accomplish and how with regard to Ukraine and getting Ukraine further on its feet and the Russians out. So um, yes, the Assistant Secretary for European Affairs could do that, but that would be an immense burden on his or her time, apart from all the other enormous uh, portfolio that, apart from the other enormous portfolio that, that this office is carrying, and uh, you as a former diplomat know exactly what I mean. So that's why I think it's essential that some really eminent and capable person, if there is a Holbrook out there, because yes, Holbrook was an SOB, but he got things done. Uh, uh, who, somebody like that was who was able to get something done, or, and to knock heads not only among Moscow, but in, in Paris and Berlin uh, as well. Uh, that would be, I think, uh, a major step forward, provided there is a U.S. strategy. If there's no strategy, it doesn't matter whom you appoint. Another good point. Holbrook was a, an extraordinary talent. Newland and Volcker both did superb work on the negotiations in their time. And Walter, we're returning this to you again, more or less back on time. Yes, and um, um, actually this time I could have actually allowed for, for folks because uh, apparently... Uh, uh, the last speaker, Mr. Mushevets, uh, uh, apparently has the, had the same things that uh, the minister had had initially, but he's in a different place. He's on the Eastern Front. He's literally visiting the Eastern Front. And apparently, uh, uh, Andrew has indicated that, uh, has indicated that he's uh, not going to be able to uh, uh, if, connect. If you with would us. like, and our other panelists agree, I can do one more round of questions. Yeah, because I actually, yeah, I, I put in a question uh, as a result of that, and it was actually aimed at uh, General Hodges, uh, but... Um, Go ahead, ask the question. Yeah, can I? Can I? Please. Yes. Um, we lost um, it. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I am, um, General Hodges, it, I'm, I'm also interested in the Black Sea area, and uh, I just wanted to know, given the fact, I asked that question in chat by mistake, uh, given the fact that the Black Sea is the major source of, of Russian naval projection into the Mediterranean, and given the fact that the Americans, whether it was or, uh, kind of early planning in, in one, if they had to do it that way, two certainly used North Africa to get into Europe to save Europe, and the Cold War uh, was the same. And given the fact that we now have in Eastern Mediterranean, them stirring, you know, as they say, Duda uh, in both Syria and Libya and so on. Um, given all of that, and given the fact that if Crimea uh, stays Russian, it can go nuclear, and therefore that that adds a completely new dimension to things. Wouldn't you think that the U.S. naval folksmen, and uh, certainly I know you, and I heard uh, General Breedlove, I heard you, I heard Wes Clark say it. But wouldn't even the naval folksmen really have pushed more uh, for the fact that uh, there should be more presence in the Black Sea, not allow the Russians to make it a, a Ruski Ozero, you know, Russian lane? Sorry about the long winded question, but I, I thought it, to get to the point. Thanks, Walter. And, and I had read your question already uh, in the chat. Yes. Uh, sir. Uh -huh. the, uh, for the, the fact is, our great Navy is too small. I mean, they, they don't have uh, enough stuff to cover Black Sea, Mediterranean, Baltic Sea, uh, North Atlantic, 
all the responsibilities they have. U.S. Navy Europe is also U.S. Navy Africa, by the way. So it's mm. the same little group of ships. Uh, this is not the, you know, the 500 vessels that were offshore from Iwo Jima or Okinawa during the war. I mean, we're talking about on, on one hand and uh, at any one time, at least one of them is responsible for ballistic missile defense in the Eastern Mediterranean to help protect our Israeli allies and others. So uh, it's just very limited. That's why every time you hear about a, uh, a Russian air, aircraft buzzing a U.S. Navy vessel in the Black Sea, it's always the Donald Cook because it's the same poor ship all the time. And then two weeks later, the Donald Cook's up in the Arctic. You're like, holy hell, how'd they do that? And, and it's, that's what we're having to do. So it's gonna take a uh, reprioritization within the Department of Defense and the administration to say, no, nope, we gotta put more here. But of course, the uh, commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Davidson, my old friend, just delivered a bill to the Congress for $23 billion for what he needs in the where the, the higher priority Chinese threat is. So I think you know that, your listeners know that, this is about priorities. Uh, and so the solution can't be, it will not be more US Navy. It's gonna be, how do you get Royal Navy, the German Navy, the Italian Navy, mm. other allies uh, to get in there? How do we get Turkey to do more in the, in the Black Sea? Turkey, their whole Navy is focused on another NATO ally, Greece. So, I mean, so this has got to be part of the solution. Um, I don't envision Romania, Bulgaria, you know, growing the size of their Navy, not surface vessels anymore, but there is a lot of promising technology that I'm excited about. And I'm an infantry soldier, but I'm excited about maritime unmanned systems, drones that are very effective against submarines, uh, detecting mines and doing reconnaissance. And I think these are very, uh, uh, effective as well as more efficient than trying to grow the size of the uh, everybody else's Navy in the region. Last point I'd make, we need a NATO headquarters where everybody wakes up in the morning smelling the Black Sea. Right now, command and control for NATO happens in Naples and in London. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need some where they wake up in the morning and they go, ah, the Black Sea, and they're thinking about it, they're coordinating and uh, exercises and sharing intelligence between NATO and non-NATO countries. John? Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, uh, like Ben, I'm obsessed with the Black Sea. Uh, I was about to say. I was and, about and, to ask. And Ben knows that because uh, we've talked about it. Well, it's not only a question of building military capacity. As, as Ben pointed out, Turkey is now facing off the, with the Greek Navy. What is needed is a diplomatic strategy that will open doors to greater allied participation in the Black Sea, as well as leaping ahead to use these new technologies, which I agree with him, because we can't afford to keep building large scale surface ships and it takes too long to do it anyway. You have to solve the Greco-Turkish problem, or at least to some degree in the Eastern Mediterranean about energy and uh, uh, economic exclusion zones, which is you know not a Ukrainian issue, but it's a black, but it's a Med and Black Sea issue. You've got to get allies to contribute more and and build more, and they can do it. But we also have to build you know smart. I mean, new technologies. The problem is again, the U.S. Navy needs to grow. But even if you grow the Navy, you know how long it takes to build surface ships and capital ships and submarines. So in the meantime, you need all these other things, plus a political strategy and the understanding of putting a command and control, a command center in the Black Sea and working with states to do things. Now, for example, Bulgaria is a major problem here because in many ways, Bulgaria is a Trojan horse for the Russians, certainly on energy and, on, and, in, and in other ways as well. But again, this is not a military issue per se. It's not something you can delegate to the Pentagon. It's delegated to the entire government, the State Department, the economy, and so on, where we orchestrate maximum synergies among our allies and among our collective defense capabilities through political and economic means. Okay. Walter, do you still need some more time? 
No, actually, uh, if they had not, uh, but but if Melinda or Mr. Alexander would uh, would want to chime in, well, on I've got the, I've got another question, which I think. Yes. Oh, you do. Oh, yes, we do. No, no. Yes. If you want, we'll, we'll go one more question. No, 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 I, no. I have fact, to go. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. This is a quick answer from from all four of you. What's gonna What's gonna be the story in the East one year from today? Hmm. Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> okay, Alexander, we'll let you go first. <laughs> we got another three hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, you each get two minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have two hours for answer for this question, but I simply uh, try to answer in two words to uh, continue countering Russian aggression and to create an opportunity for real ceasefire real ceasefire, not which we have right now, but uh, situation which we are monitoring and keeping best, uh, peace uh, keeping forces. Without peace keeping forces, we will never finish this situation. Thank, Thank you. you. Belinda. Ooh. Ooh. John, on the, the the military picture, nothing's going to change. But I think the Ukrainian government is going to spend more time and energy investing in important institutions um, like the um, the Leadership Academy that's out in the East, that's bringing people from East and West together. I think they may look at opening an airport. I think there's important real things that, that can be done, even if you can't get the Russians to change their position. Thank you. And Thank also... You. I think the sorry the Ukrainian government I think is is going to increase and, and start uh, I, I think they'll they'll put more attention uh, to the TV station that they've started out east as well. Mm. So I think it's going to be more hearts and minds work. That's where the opportunity is. Okay, General. Well, sir, uh, I would be in favor of a peacekeeping force if it was on the actual legal border between Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I, I would absolutely not be in favor of a peacekeeping force which would in effect uh, harden the current sort of line of contact as the border. That that would be the that would be the the problem. So um, what happens in two years if the Biden administration really does follow through on it's a priority and no kidding they do all these things and we take steps to make the uh, uh, to get Germany and France to hold the Kremlin accountable and we start competing in all these areas and by the way we need to make the commander of the Black Sea Fleet very, very uncomfortable in his illegal headquarters. He needs to wake up every morning thinking, oh man, I'm in range of all these systems. I've got Romanian Navy and uh, Ukrainian Navy out there putting mines around Crimea. Uh, my ships are not allowed to dock anywhere. I mean, we've got to make it very, very painful. If we don't do any of those things, then in the next two years, uh, the water, the so-called water crisis in Crimea will serve as a pretext uh, for a humanitarian disaster, and the Russians will have no choice but to go in and save the poor people that are dying of, uh, of lack of water um, caused by the evil government in Kiev. And so that will be the pretext for them to finish sealing off the Ukraine's coast uh, and, and isolating Ukraine from the Black Sea. Thank you, Steve. Last word is yours. Uh, thank you again. Uh I think militarily, I don't think anything will change unless there's political change and that has to take place in a number of capitals. Uh, I think Washington is gonna to continue to bring pressure to bear on Moscow. But to me, the real question is what happens in the German election in October? Mm -hmm. What kind of government comes into Berlin? Will the new government in Berlin actually uh, do something collectively against Russia instead of talking collectively and acting individually? And third, will, Zelensky actually follow through on reforms and military strengthening to the point where we can begin to do some of the things that Ben uh, has talked about and uh, do that in conjunction with a major U.S. diplomatic offensive because it will then be backed up hopefully with economic pressure as well as uh, political pressure not only from the U.S. but from members of the EU and, or NATO allies as well. And also fourth the other thing is to what degree the Turkish transfer of technology and weapons to Ukraine gets deployed into the fields so that those Turkish drones can start threatening Russian positions because they don't have a good answer for it. Right, Steve, thank you very much. Walter, we've overfulfilled the plan. Yes, you have. 
I think it's time for our panel to step down. Yes, but it, it, it's just such, I must say, it's just such a delightful panel. Um, everybody just uh, uh, as good as they are in, in their field. And I just really wanted to appreciate it. And uh, Ambassador Herbst, again, I wanted to say um, uh, there, there's been a Penelope of, of these veteran diplomats that we've had when we talk about it. Um, and you're in that, you know, uh, uh, we, we talk about the Taylors and the Herps, and tomorrow we'll have uh, Courtney and, and Papa Dukes that have been our friends. And without, without that, and without those wonderful generals that we have, the, 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 the Hodgeses and the Breedloves and the Clarks, um, it's a real compliment. It's, it's, it's good that we have them as friends of Ukraine. It's also good that the United States has the envoys and generals like we have. Because uh, that's why the United States has that exceptional role in the world. And I really believe that. So with that, I just, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I pushed a little for exceptionalism there. And uh, for Mr. Litvinenko, um, your reputation precedes you, sir. Um, uh, you and Steve Blank are those, those wonderful uh, think tankers that, uh, that actually make, that, that shape policy without... Without, without having to actually uh, have a position of power somewhere. So um, I'm very grateful to all of you. Melinda, thank you very, very much. Uh, it was a wonderful addition. And, uh, and I'm grateful to all of you. Tomorrow, um, we start at uh, 9.50. Uh, we start day two. And we are going to be following up on some of the issues you've raised. Today, we had political subversion. And, um, and we have the issue of external aggression. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be dealing with economic and, and, and energy security, and um, also dealing with dis disinformation, uh, kind of uh, a, a continuation of the discussion we had today, uh, disinformation and cyber warfare. We will also uh, have um, two very important folks uh, from Congress, uh, Senator Cardin, and that's been confirmed again, and set uh, and Representative Harris uh, to talk about both uh, what the Senate and Congress will be doing in a kind of bipartisan fashion to help um, aid uh, Ukraine. So, with all of that, uh, I'm very, very grateful to all of you, and I want to thank everyone again, uh, not only uh, our wonderful panelists and chairs, but uh, also uh, I want to thank the um, audience. They've been very patient. Um, and, uh, and uh, till tomorrow. So I invite everybody at 9, 9.50. And again, thank you for these wonderful panels. <laughs> Good luck. Good night.